You get clearance? I asked as Kim approached my workstation. Some questions about a cousin with a big following on Instagram, but that's about it, she replied. Not the most normal background check I've been through. I don't really get the big deal though. They brought me here. Why do I need further clearance just to enter this funny little place? It's about containment, I said. No one thinks you're going to steal equipment or military secrets, although God knows my drones are valuable enough to the right people. I reached out and patted the sleek black hull of the car-sized submersible laid out on the large workbench before me. They're concerned about more generalized social media leaks, what they have here. Well, it's odd to say the least. Has Alex briefed you yet? Yeah, he did, she answered. I'm assuming that's... She nodded towards the enormous pressure chamber that dominated the room. I didn't really think it was true when Alex told me, she continued. They're talking about a possible inland sea that was sealed off a hundred thousand years ago, right? They say the pressure keeps this liquid. That's the official story, but no one knows for sure, I replied. Unlike Lake Vostok, no one knew this place was here until they stumbled across it. Alex's team was originally here just doing meteorological work. How did they drill a tunnel down to it if they didn't know it was there? Kim asked as she stepped past me and went to the chamber's bulkhead. My guess is they were doing something they shouldn't be, I answered while moving beside her to look through the glass. You'll probably find the US government is up to all sorts down here, and that's why they're keeping it secret. I mean, it's that, or what Alex told me is true, and that's just, well, not possible. What did he say? He told me the hole appeared on its own, I shrugged. The chamber came afterwards to allow access and stop the water flooding upwards from the pressure. She leaned forward and wiped the condensation of the tiny little window on the steel door. Maybe that's why they don't want us telling anyone about it, Kim replied. Maybe they don't know what's down there yet, and they want to know first before celebrating it as a scientific discovery of the century. Kim stood on her toes to look through the glass and into the water below. Beyond was a small room with a floor covering in churning black water that never seemed to stay still. The movement reminded me of an ocean in miniature with waves that never stopped. Sometimes, if I stared too long, I felt a kind of vertigo from the warped perspective, like I was looking down on some colossal ancient ocean from hundreds of feet in the air. I couldn't help but wonder what made the water move like that. I figured that it must be driven by forces and currents that originated miles beneath the ice, which was a sobering reminder that I was staring at a direct connection to a primordial abyss unlike any other on the planet. Gotta wonder what's down there, Kim muttered. I didn't respond. She might have continued talking, but if she did, it was lost to me. The whole world was reduced to a background hum that barely registered while the water dominated my view with mesmerizing force. The currents had changed. I couldn't say for sure, but for the briefest of moments, it had looked as if the water had been disturbed by something below. I could have sworn I saw something slithering just beneath the waves. I shook my head and dismissed the thought. Come on, I told her. We've got work to do. What's that? Alex reached out to the seemingly featureless video feed on the 100-inch monitor. For the last 20 minutes, it had shown us nothing but black fuzzy noise as the drone descended into what had been dubbed Lake Saturn. The room stayed silent with anticipation, despite the dozen or so people crowded around me as I clutched the joystick with white knuckles. I didn't see anything, I answered. Probably just noise. If anything gets close, we'll know for sure. The light on this thing could cut through brick. What are we expecting to see in this water exactly? Kim asked. I'd be shocked if life down there is multicellular. It's been cut off from the outside world for hundreds of thousands of years. A pale, thin tentacle whipped past, both languid and lightning fast, as if its size and speed were somehow mismatched. All at once, everyone lurched away from the screens, reacting like the monster might reach through the glass and snatch one of us. For a few seconds, we were all dumbfounded until the tension eased and people let out astonished gasps and nervous chuckles. A few scientists even cried out in celebration before scurrying away to a smaller desk to agonize over the recorded footage. Well, 
Now we know, I said, utterly astonished. Multicellular life. Another tentacle whipped past, and the accelerometers on the drone registered a kinetic shock, not that we saw or heard anything of it. The drone's camera showed only pixelated darkness. It's just scoping us out, I said, looking intently at the profile of the acceleration on the drone's instruments. The submersible was being nudged a little from side to side, but it was hardly under attack. It might even be described as a light cuddle considering the size of the drone and the monster doing it. The encounter lasted a few seconds at most before the squid retreated back into the deep as quickly as it emerged. Jesus, Kim cried. The ventral camera and LiDAR instruments measure it at 30 feet long. World record for a verified specimen was 22 feet, I said. So, that's the first record broken on this mission. Kim and I began to laugh like excited children, and after a few seconds, the others joined in. I've never been so happy to be so wrong, she grinned. Life, honest to God, multicellular life. There must be an ecosystem down here. Predators, prey, some kind of base to it, bacteria, fungi, maybe even some kind of plant. The sub's descent continued. Occasionally, the sonar would pick up passing shapes in the void, but nothing else came close enough to register visually. It was unnerving, if I'm honest. Even though I was perfectly safe, I couldn't help but imagine myself down there in that impossibly black water while unseen shapes glided silently around me, just a few dozen meters away. It took another hour before we were within 30 feet of the bottom, at which point I slowed the sub's descent and, using downward-facing ventral cameras, looked for some sign of the lake bed. What finally resolved on the smaller screen was a complicated array of strange and irregular looking rocks. There were spiraling ammonites and lifeless shells everywhere, strange bones jutting out of what looked like an endless carpet of bone-white death. What? I muttered. Animals must have been trapped in the water when it froze over, Alex said. Animal graveyards are common when excavated dried up lake beds. This is normal? I asked. No, he shook his head. Not like this. Not so many. Talk about an understatement, I said, as I began to pilot the drone in an outward spiral. Every camera showed the same thing. An endless plane of jumbled ivory that stretched out in every direction. If there was a floor beneath those bones, we couldn't see it in that location. So, what does the squid eat? Kim asked. If everything in the lake died... As if, in answer, our portside camera picked up the sluggish movement of a pale white starfish. Slowly, it crawled out of the nasal bone of an ancient whale and probed its surroundings. It's 30 feet wide, I said, as I squinted the readings on one of the dozen screens. Do starfish come that big normally? Most of the biologists were too busy taking notes to answer, which I took to be a no but Alex was polite enough to tear his eyes from the screen and answer. Absolutely not, he said. It must grow so big from a lack of... A fish larger than the drone swept past the screen and the starfish was gone. I had the fleeting impression of glassy transparent teeth and an eyeless face worse than anything found in the Challenger Deep. Wrinkled and frowning, it was an aquatic nightmare that left me shaking in my seat. What the hell? Kim groaned. Jesus, that was... Not that, she said, tapping me on my shoulder and gesturing to another screen. There's something odd about a hundred yards east. We need to take a look. She reached for the controls and I stopped her. Despite the intense desire to get up and leave, I felt compelled to see this through. I grabbed the joystick and began to navigate on the heading she gave. My eyes so fixed on numerical readouts that I let my eyes drift from the main screen. Oh my god. I looked up, worried I made a grievous error and damaged the drone, and what I saw made my body go limp. We were looking... at a building. A temple, in fact. I couldn't say for sure it was a place of worship, of course, but there was no other way to describe the grave-looking structure with its ancient pillars and decorative flourishes, 
reminiscent of ancient Greece. Perplexed, I let go of the controls and sat back, head tilted like a confused dog. In the end, I settled for what seemed like the only logical explanation. Is this a prank? Some of the other scientists with me actually agreed. Kim and several biologists all nodding while turning to look at Alex, the head of the facility. But the look on his face made it clear that if this was a hoax, he wasn't in on it. He was pale, eyes wide, every bit as shocked as we were. Why would we do that? He asked us. How would we even manage it? Those steps are 30 feet tall, someone cried before I could push the point any further. I looked away from the screen to see a geologist stood by one of the dozens of smaller screens filled with complex readings. Can you get closer? He asked me. I took a look at the drone camera and approached the first of 20 steps ascending from the lake bed towards the temple. Pretty quickly, I was able to confirm that each step was a gargantuan slab of stone that towered above the drone. This is real? I asked Alex as he stepped closer to me, my voice an urgent whisper. He nodded. I looked back at the screen and saw that I was still piloting the drone up and over the steps. At the top, it was apparent just how out of proportion the rest of the temple was. The doorway, a great big yawning black portal, must have been several hundred feet tall and it loomed over the submersible like a man over an ant. Our lights barely penetrated the dark from where we hovered at the threshold, but they did show a stony floor retreating into the void, its surface covered in snowy detritus. In the distance, another tentacle slipped briefly into the light before slithering away. Something about its pallid white features in the sunken dark made my skin crawl, and when I looked up at the crowd, I saw I wasn't the only one whose nerves were frayed. Sweaty, pale faces stared at the screen, unable to look away, but utterly distraught at the implications of what they were seeing. Here was a building at the bottom of the world, standing impossibly tall and impossibly large, its doorway beckoning us to explore further. Should I keep going? I asked, hoping someone would find a good reason to stop. It didn't matter that it wasn't me down there, I didn't want to push this journey deeper into madness. I was afraid, and no matter how much I reminded myself of the vast differences between me and the source of the images on screen, I could not escape the terrifying fact that the things I was seeing were real. Somewhere beneath my feet lay that abyss, and within it lay a temple beyond all human proportions, and the thought made me feel like my mind was on fire. Keep going, Kim said and I knew she was right to. It was the only choice. We need to know. Nervously, I pushed the drone onwards, watching with anxiety as the side camera showed the edge of the portal sliding by our sides. As impossible as it was, I felt as though I was personally stepping into the temple and could feel a cold draft wash over my skin. I shivered and did my best to push the ridiculous idea aside. The room beyond was massive, too large for our meager little lights to see much. After a few seconds of nerve-wracking silence, I finally found my courage to ask, Do the instruments pick anything out? I feel like I need directions here. Uh, we're getting something a little south of your position. It's stationary, so it should be... The entire room cried out as the drone's camera was violently shaken the view reeling as if the whole drone was being thrown around. Alarms blared from a dozen monitors as every system registered a dozen violations of expected norms. My hands froze up. I was unsure how to proceed. There was a momentary spike of adrenaline as my body reacted as though I'd personally been attacked. And then training took over as I let go of the controls and waited for a few seconds as a flurry of bubbles and strange shapes flitted past the lens. The drone can't be damaged easily, I told everyone. Not by an animal, we just need to be patient. Eventually, the alarms quieted down as different team members worked to shut them off. I watched the accelerometer intensely. 
I could tell that whatever was attacking the drone was slowing down, probably because it realized its prey wasn't edible. Looks like another squid, someone called, pointing to a dorsal camera that showed a slimy feeler clamped around the hull. Just wait, I said. It's out of our hands now, but if we're patient, he should just leave us alone. For a few more minutes, the drone continued to move of its own accord, being pulled to and fro by some unseen shape. Occasionally, we would catch a glimpse of an overhead ceiling covered in detailed mosaics of a fleshy-looking mountain, or of a beautiful stone pillar cradling an ancient brassiere. But there was no opportunity to study these things in detail. They appeared as fleeting blurs of color and shape. Whatever was down there was wrestling with a submersible like it expected a meal out of it, but I knew eventually it would have to give up. Look! Whoever cried out didn't need to bother. Whatever had attacked the drone slid around its sleek hull until it faced the forward camera, allowing itself to be seen in full light for the first time. It towered over us from the main display like it was somehow aware that we were on the other side of the camera. But whether it was angry, hostile, or just plain curious, I couldn't say. It merely stared at us with an eyeless cone for a head. Slowly, the strange creature retreated from the light. That didn't mean it was finished with us, though. One of its longest tendrils remained stuck to the drone, which it used to tow us carefully back towards the entrance of the temple. Well, this is exciting, I said after a few minutes passed. It's throwing us out of its house. You're not seriously proposing it built that thing? Kim asked. No, I said. Why build steps if you don't have feet? I think it's just moved in probably makes for great shelter. The creature stopped just as it reached the doorway. All of a sudden, it changed color, flashing from spectral white to a blood orange, pulsating over and over while we all stared at the baffling change in behavior. A threat display, perhaps? Kim asked. As quickly as it appeared, the squid shrank away, letting go of the drone right by the temple's doorway. A quick glance at the rear camera showed it fleeing back into the darkness. I was about to ask what had happened when a strange cerulean light flooded the doorway. An eye blocked the doorway, a pupilless pale blue sphere that glowed with malice in the dark. Slowly, its owner retreated until a monstrous shape glowered down at us. A faint bioluminescence hung around it like an aura, a silhouette faintly visible in the abyss. Its shape was utterly alien. If it hadn't moved, I might have thought I was looking at a plant or a strange rock formation. It reminded me of tumors and wasp nests. I couldn't tell all of its eyes apart from the complicated pattern of dots and frills that covered a bubbling asymmetrical head the size of an apartment block. It was with ever-rising horror that I realized I had glimpsed simple portrayals of this very creature in the temple mosaics the implications of which burned at my mind like a hot coal. This thing dwarfed all reason, all sense. It floated menacingly in the darkness, just at the limits of the light. Of the rest of its body, there was no sign. But I hated it. I hated it instinctively and without reason, even as I told myself it was a scientific find of the century. It made my skin crawl and my stomach drop, and all I wanted to do was lash out and get the hell away from it. Slowly, it raised the branching, writhing appendage towards the drone. That was when we lost the feed. The wind outside was fierce. The facility we were staying in was situated on a continental plain, not far from a cluster of inland mountains where the wind swept down the slopes and sped up, unimpeded to hundreds of miles per hour. It never snowed in Antarctica, but that didn't stop hurricane winds from snatching up tiny particles of ice and whipping them at you with terrifying speed. The effect was a whiteout, a grey, sombre void on the other side of every window that left nothing visible. No sky, no sun, not even the icy floor beneath the main building's elevated foundations. It's almost too much, Kim said after a while. If we just found a jellyfish, it wouldn't be a lot but people would believe us. But this, it's like something out of a bad movie. 
How am I supposed to get up at a conference and show people this footage? Kim, Alex and I were sat in the canteen. All the other scientists had wandered off to their own rooms to begin the lifetime's task of going through every reading we had. Every pulse of sonar, every bit of infrared, every minute fluctuation in temperature and pressure. It had to be understood, catalogued, made sense of. In a way, it was probably a comfort to them to hide from the madness by fixating on the minute. You know what I think, Kim said. Forget any results. I want to leave. Let someone else get the glory. Even if we wanted to, Alex said. The storm prohibits flying for at least another week. Just so long as I can be the first one out, she replied. Maybe when the storm's clear we can discuss people leaving, I said. But for now, we've got enough data to last us a lifetime and enough equipment to analyse. Sir. A young man burst into the room. I immediately recognised him as belonging to the security attachment that had flown in with me. So far, the five or six armed men had kept separate from the scientists. I could have easily forgotten that there was anyone staying in the facility who wasn't a researcher. It must have been an incredibly boring job, at least under normal circumstances. The man who stood before me didn't look bored though. He looked worried out of his depth. Alex was clearly the sir he'd been referring to, and the older man immediately stood up and addressed him. What's going on? he asked. There's been a breach, sir, he said. Something has entered the chamber. How do you possibly know that? Alex cried. We can hear it, sir. We entered the ground building to find that we had two immediate problems. The first was that the pressurized chamber was under intense stress. Internal reading showed that water had flooded the room and was applying incredible force against the reinforced walls. So far, they were holding, but the pressure was steadily increasing and we knew that, sooner or later, something would give. The second problem was the sound that emanated from within. Thunk, thunk, thunk. I flinched each time it rang out, physically recoiling from the bulkhead with fear. I tried to hide it from the others, but looking around, I realised it wasn't necessary. Alex, Kim and the security guard were all equally terrified. Something was inside that room. Something that had come up from the lake below and was patiently beating a tattoo against the wall with unsettling regularity. I am here, the sound seemed to say. I am here, and I want to meet you. We need to release the pressure, Alex said. His voice was shaky, his skin pale. We need to... I'm not opening that door, Kim snapped. I looked at the pressure readings and grimaced. It's not giving us a choice, I said. If that structure fails, it'll be worse than a bomb going off. All the more reason not to open it, Kim cried. Think about what you just said. It's not giving us a choice. Do you want to play that game? We don't know what it wants, Alex replied. We don't know what it is. Maybe... Maybe what, she said. Maybe it's here to play chess, to be our friend. Is that seriously what we're proposing? If that chamber blows, I said, we get answers to those questions whether we like it or not. We can retreat to safety, sure, but it doesn't make any of our problems go away. Besides, it doesn't have to be the door we open. There are specialized valves to release pressure that we can use to keep it from blowing. Thunk, thunk, thunk. If Kim had any counter-arguments, they were forgotten. The walls of the chamber had shaken, and something, some screw or bolt, had flung out and struck the ceiling and punched the hole right through. Alex, I said, help me get the pressure valves open. This is insane, Kim cried as I walked over to the nearest valve. Thunk, thunk. The knocking stopped just as my hand gripped the wheel. A look at Alex showed he was sweating despite the cold. He hesitated to come any closer, lurking a few feet away from me and the chamber. I need help. I told him. Okay, he said, nodding so absentmindedly, I wondered if he was in some kind of shock. Come on, I cried while pointing to the opposite side of the wheel. Alex was startled by my shouting, but he finally started to walk across the vent and towards me. Alex, we don't need to do... Kim started to say, before she was suddenly cut off. Thunk. 
the final hammer blow was louder than any other we'd heard. It was like a peal of thunder went off right next to my ear. An explosive punch delivered with perfect timing, and I soon realized in a very precise location. The valve broke open just as Alex had passed the opening. Water gushed out with tremendous force, enough to knock him back. Internal mechanisms were designed to control the flow and they stopped the blow from being lethal. But it was still a brutal strike and he was sent skittering across the floor while the water spewed out in a furious torrent. I could see him under the black brine, struggling desperately, and I thanked God he was alive. I immediately ran over to drag Alex away from bubbling water, even as my mind raced with the terrifying realization that whatever had attacked the chamber had done so with impossible insight. On some level, I knew it must be scrutinizing us, and it took every ounce of courage just to stay in the room. Alex struggled as I took hold of one of his legs and tried to pull him out from under the water. I paid it little attention and dragged him clear of the flow, intent on helping him. But the insight of a glistening black tentacle wrapped around his head made me recoil and cry out. But the sight of a glistening black tentacle wrapped around his head made me recoil and cry out. I fell on my ass and heard a chorus of disgusted and horrified cries as Kim and some new arrivals took register of the strange growth that enveloped the man's head. It was a repulsive cluster of alien musculature attached to a glistening black tendril trailing back through the open valve. Get it off, I shouted at the room in general, hoping to God that someone would have an idea what to do. Alex's struggles were already growing faint. Thunk, thunk, thunk. Before any of us could take another breath, there was the briefest sound of tightening fibers before the tendril whipped back into the chamber. It passed effortlessly through the six inch wide opening and did not slow or even show any sign of a struggle. Not even when, with the sound of silk tearing, it took most of Alex with it. I had made the decision to withdraw from the study and the site at large. Kim was clearly relieved and so was I. Whatever excitement we felt over the find was diminished by the memory of having to clean up Alex's remains. I knew I would never forget having to lift the body bag only to realize it barely weighed more than 20 kilos. We had found something nightmarish down in that lake and the small encounter we'd already survived were more than enough to keep me sleepless for years to come. Unfortunately, the storm was still raging outside and we had no hope of evacuation by air for at least another three days. Kim and I were kept busy packing up our equipment, but Kim's speciality was data analysis and not engineering, so there were times where the work fell entirely on me. It was on the second night that I told her to head to bed early while I finished up the last 30 minutes or so of work, but only a few minutes after she left, I found myself staring at the chamber that dominated the room like a strange obelisk. The image of that thing glaring at us through the screen returned to me, and with a shiver, I decided I would finish packing the rest in the morning. Staying alone in that place for even a moment or two was a stupid thing to do. Stephen? The sound was an electric whisper that made my limbs weak and my hands falter. Equipment hit the ground with a clatter I barely heard. All my attention was on one of the speakers by a station at the back wall. It belonged to one of the geologists who had loaded microphones down in the original dive and was using them to record an audio profile of the lake below. With everything going on, it had escaped all of our notice. But as I stared at the glowing green monitor, it dawned on me that the microphone was probably the last remaining piece of equipment still in the water. So why had I just heard Alex speak my name into it? I told myself I'd been mistaken, even as I decided I would sprint the whole way back to my room. Stephen, the voice said before I could take a single step. Stephen, it's cold down here. This isn't real, I muttered. I know what the temple was built for. Alex's voice was the wet gurgle of a pneumonia patient in their last days. It made me think of someone drowning in mucus 
of a desperate soul consumed by pain and despair. Stephen, he wailed, it won't let me die. His words hit me like a sledgehammer. For a second, I thought there was nothing in the entire world that could frighten me more. It was then that the door to the pressure chamber swung open. I found myself rooted to the spot with mounting terror as my mind processed the impossible. An enormous titanium bulkhead, otherwise inoperable to anything except powerful hydraulics, had glided open like a creaking mansion door. Black water immediately bubbled forth and filled the air with rolling steam and a cloying stench unlike anything else I'd ever smelled. It was awful. A foul mixture of rotting flesh, ammonia, and a musty scent that really was unrivaled. Some kind of flotsam came with. Pale stripes of strange looking plants and unrecognizable biological matter. The room I was in was large, but by the time I managed to look down and realized that my shoes were already wet and time was running out. I turned and ran, desperate to outrace the water that was already surging past my feet and flowing towards the door threatening to trip me. All around me, equipment started to topple, desks dragged along the floor with an ear-cringing squeal while computers short-circuited and fell over. Under other circumstances, I would have been in tears from the loss of data and expensive one-of-a-kind technology, but I was ready to sacrifice anything if it meant getting out of there sooner. I pushed ahead, increasingly aware that the water was fast on its way to flooding the entire place and showed no signs of slowing. Pretty soon, I'd be wading through the stuff at knee height. The thought had me picking up my pace, but I managed to only get halfway to the door before the lights cut out. Immediately, my foot hit something unseen. Something that moved. I was sent sprawling forwards, completely blind and fumbling in the dark. Despite the water, I hit the concrete hard and my wrist rolled, plunging me face first in the ever-rising torrent. The feel of it enclosing my head made my heart pound with hysterical panic, and for a brief second, I wondered if I might already be dead and trapped in my worst nightmare. Eventually, the panic passed, and, using my good hand, I got some purchase on the floor and pushed myself up with a desperate gasp. With perfect timing, the emergency lights finally kicked in, and the room was suffused in the dim pale glow of rarely used fluorescence. I'd been thrown halfway across the room and was further from the door than ever, but the water had stopped rising and was eerily still. All the different workstations had been shifted to new locations by the current, but were now at rest, bits of equipment strewn haplessly across the surfaces or missing somewhere in water below. Once I was standing, the only sound was the occasional slosh of water and the all-pervading drip, drip, drip. Quietly, terrified that the movement would attract attention, I lifted one leg and took a step backwards. Nothing changed above the surface, but for all I knew, a dozen unseen shapes were converging on my position, and I had no way to stop them, or even know how long I had to live. The only thing I could do was stick to the plan, and keep moving one foot at a time. I managed another three steps when one of the desks slid a few inches across the floor. It was a gut-wrenching reminder that something was active beneath the water. It didn't help that all manner of things floated around, ranging from office furniture to unrecognizable clumps of rotting albino plants. Sometimes, something would slither past my leg, touching my bare ankles, and I had no way of knowing if it was a living thing or just some dead piece of floatsam drifting aimlessly beneath the surface. When the door opened behind me, it was a sudden reminder that a world existed beyond that room. It had been barely ten minutes since I heard Alex speak, but I'd spent that time so terrified that my perception had narrowed until I could only think of things that mattered to my direct survival. I'd completely forgotten that the power outage would have alerted others. I was so fixed on whatever shared that water with me that I didn't even turn to greet my rescuers or respond to their cries. Nothing but survival could find purchase 
in my adrenaline-addled mind. It wasn't until I heard feet splashing past me and saw several men stomping past, guns raised, that I looked up and saw Kim reaching out to touch my shoulder. What happened? She asked. Did you open the bulkhead? I must have been pale as a ghost, because when I looked at her, she froze up a little, like my fear was contagious. Shut it down, I hissed between clenched teeth, even as I lifted one leg to continue my painstaking backwards walk. Explosives, grenades, anything, shut it down. It'll freeze on its own anyway, she replied. The heating rods have turned off. That's probably why it hasn't flooded this whole room up to the ceiling. Why did you open the door? She repeated. I didn't open anything, I whispered. Kim, we aren't alone in here. What? He said, you aren't alone up there. Kim's eyes went wide as dinner plates at the sound of Alex's voice coming from the speaker. Screw this, I cried while grabbing a hand and turning to run the last few meters back to the door. As I turned away, one of the men inside the room cried out and went down, but I didn't turn to look back. Not even when gunfire rang out and ricochets pinged the wall nearest my head. Instead, I forced leaden feet through the grimy water, Kim in tow, and did my best to ignore the screams. When we reached the door, I threw us both out onto the metal walkway beyond and went to slam the door shut but was left struggling against the water that continuously poured out. Help! I cried, reaching out to help Kim from where she had fallen. What about the men inside? She looked inside at the same time she asked the question. By now the gunfire had stopped, but there was still the sound of struggling feet and crying men, along with crashing furniture. With a whip crack sound, one of the men let out a terrible scream, and Kim jerked back from the doorway her face covered in blood. Shut the damn door, she screamed suddenly. Whatever she had seen had clearly changed her mind, and I was glad I'd missed it. I was only grateful that she joined me in pushing it in. Are you sure it's all done in there? I asked. The water's all frozen. Kim nodded as we stood by the door to the ground facility. It had been two days and we had stayed in the base a few hundred meters away, refusing to answer any of the other scientists' questions and threatening hell on anyone who dared to go look for themselves. It certainly hadn't earned us any friends, but we didn't care. Our evac was just an hour out, and we were all too ready to leave that godforsaken continent. But there was still one last job to do. Using a crowbar, I wrenched the door out of its frame, Kim made a passing comment that whatever lived down there could have easily gotten out if it wanted to, but I just ignored it. I had no way of knowing what the thing could or couldn't do, and for once, ignorance was enough for me. Whatever its motivations or choices, it had been content with taking the men we'd left behind, and no one else. To my shame, I only felt relief about this. Steven, I'm so cold, my mind is falling apart, I can feel bits of myself sloughing away, what are you, I can't see you, where am I, what was that, something's coming, Jesus Christ, why won't I die? Kim faltered at the sound of their voices, she looked at me with terror, and I knew she'd seen the same thing written on my face. You were right, she said. They're still. I nodded. I could hear them when I came out to check the door on the first night. I don't... How are they... Are they down there? She cried. I don't know. I shook my head. But there'll be a team here soon. They'll find the tunnel frozen over, the facility destroyed, our data centers ruined. But this... I gestured to the room with the voices within... This will demand further investigation, she said. How can we get them to stop? Do you have a plan to help them? To get inside the room, I had to step up onto a solid foot of ice that had frozen. Emergency lighting had failed entirely by now, but there was enough daylight to make the gloomy place beyond visible. 
The heads, Kim stuttered as she looked at the array of corpses. They're all gone. How are they? I don't... I don't understand either, I said as I carefully shoveled over to the farthest workstation. It was there that the voices cried out from an overturned speaker. But we can't help them. I hesitated for a moment as I took out the wire cutters and found the cord leading to the ruined pressure chamber. Even now, the men hadn't stopped baying like a discordant mob of hellbound souls. There were pleas for help and desperate insults born of desperation. I wondered for a split second if there really was something we could do, but that would involve drilling down to the lake and beginning this nightmare anew. This wasn't some errant animal we were dealing with. It was intelligent and cruel and older than we could possibly imagine. Even worse, it could toy with dead men and keep them alive to prolong their suffering. There was a forgotten god down there. It needed to stay forgotten. I cut the wire and the voices stopped immediately. But they're still down there, Kim said, her voice an injured whisper. With deliberate slowness, the wire was pulled from my hand and back into the chamber before disappearing through a pinprick hole in the ice. And so is something else, I said. Let's keep it that way. Now, I'm unsure where I stand legally with this after signing an NDA, but those things only matter if you're alive, right? My name is Mac Haberstro. The Mac is short for Mackenzie, and I'm a freelance artist. Now, I'm not a painter. In fact, my work revolves around dolls. I'm not fond of them as much as the next person. Porcelain dolls scare me the most. Their lifeless eyes and dire fashion are outdated and I can't help but associate them with horror movies. I often avoid working with them unless I'm desperate for a gig, but I must admit that doing their hair is more manageable than most dolls. Despite this, I spend most of my time working on anything but porcelain. I post my work on Facebook and Instagram, as they've been the best way to reach clients, but when my niece, Laura, suggested I try and upload clips to TikTok, I saw an influx of interest in my handiwork. I was surprised to see how many people sat through a quick one minute clip of hair restoration or styling, and despite the negative stigma surrounding dolls, people loved it. Kids seemed to enjoy my guides, and I was thankful. In fact, Laura's suggestion was so helpful that I received a message requesting my phone number from THE Disney in my business email despite the address only being linked to my Facebook and Instagram. At 10.34pm the following evening, I received a call. I was tempted to ignore the obnoxious buzzing from my mobile due to how late it was. My social battery was drained from a day of putting on a personality for videos, and I just selected a movie to watch. But when I answered, the mention of a hefty sum of money soon sent electricity through my veins and I was awoken by a sheer motivator of cold, hard cash. Before I tell you about the job, I have to explain it a little. If you're not familiar with yarn, weirdly enough, it grows. Technically, it stretches over time, but when you put it on a doll, you may as well say it grows. And with the added wetness and humidity of places, such as the Disney It's a Small World ride, the doll's hair blooms, since yarn has a very high chance of splitting, you can't just hire anybody to cut the hair. It needs to be done by somebody with experience, as it means they'd have to pay another person to come and replant more. This is where I come in. When you download or sign up for something, do you read the terms and services? Because I don't. I probably should have read my contract past the first page, and maybe the NDA when I arrived in California. Over the phone, Mr. Darwin mentioned that I was allowed to take pictures for my portfolio. However, I was not allowed to livestream the process on Facebook or Instagram. 
any knowledge of the workings of Disney was not allowed to be shared. Nothing surrounding live streaming on TikTok was mentioned verbally, but I wondered if the NDA had any information that may have warned me about the experience. After the brief meeting, a senior cast member named Louise led me to where I would be staying, which from my understanding was situated right in the park. Louise was pretty young, perhaps mid-twenties, a year older than me. However, despite her young age, dark circles hidden poorly by makeup hung from her eyes, and her mousy blonde hair was thin and frail and hung in her face. She walked me around the park and showed me employee walls awarding long-service cast members. A few awards belonged to Mr. Darwin, who worked for the park for 15 years. So, you like dolls? Louise asked timidly, as if she had forgotten her role for a minute. Yeah, you could say that, but I mainly like doing their hair. I've always enjoyed it, even when I was little, I shrugged. The girls in your family must love you, she smiled softly. Soon enough, she closed the distance between us. I grew up with my dad, and he didn't know how to tie hair. She sighed, her voice hardly audible over both adults and children's joyous screams. What about your mum or sisters? I asked, afraid to overstep any boundaries. My mum passed away while I was little. My dad's side of the family didn't really have any female relatives. I gave Louise a small smile, unsure what to say and ultimately decided to change the topic. Who previously did the doll's hair? I asked, just as Louise showed me how to open my room door. I thought that a place like Disney would have a permanent guy for it. The question must have surprised her, because she fumbled with my card, and a red light flickered above the handle. Never met her. Her need to avoid eye contact made it obvious she was lying. I find it peculiar that Disney didn't have a specific person for the role. I asked Mr. Darwin on the phone when he first called, but he just told me she'd transfer to the treasure staff department, but I was hoping to speak to her about how the dolls are usually treated. Louise tried the sensor again, and this time we were greeted by the clink of a door unlocking and a green light. You should try ask him then. I didn't speak to her much. Is there anything else you need? She asked, and I shook my head no. The room was like a studio apartment, open planned with the only walled off area being the bathroom. It was cozy and a kitchen meant I could cook rather than fattening myself up on expensive attraction food. Sat on a kitchen island was an elegant but aged file on all the dolls and a small toolbox. Every single page had been laminated, but it was clear they were once left bare by the crinkles on each sheet. There was one page specifically that was aged the most and stained with purple-brown ink. The picture attached to the document seemed to have been taped on, while the others must have been glued. The image was a pretty blonde doll dressed in aged attire with a small white apron. The sheet listed her usual hair length and sign-off sheets for when the hair had been cut and replaced. But unlike the other dolls, Bella Donna had managed to keep her original yarn from 2005. Despite not being the oldest of dolls, her page had definitely been loved. In the toolkit were scissors, tonics and cotton buds to care for the dolls. Although the hair was my forte, they requested I also clean the doll's eyes and any dirt spots or mold that may have gathered since their last time of care. Mr. Tyron requests that you enjoy your free time until this evening while the park is closed. Louise smiled. We like to keep our rides operable during the day and avoid disturbing the magic for the guests while on the ride. The last thing they want to see is you working on the dolls. I'll be back to guide you this evening. And with that, she left. With Louise gone, I took the time to study each doll. Almost all of them had the same care pattern, and honestly, trimming yarn was something I'd done for decades. A few dolls with sticky notes on their pages needed particular things, such as restyling. These dolls moved a lot more, and their hair often came loose, and a few had needed more hair planted in. When evening came, Louise guided me over to the ride. An incredibly catchy tune still played 
and got louder as we approached. She took me through the back entrance, which allowed me to access the dolls from behind. Louise, I called just as she was leaving. Could you turn off the music? I asked, surprised that they went through the effort of emptying the water but left the music running. I can't, she said flatly. Is there not a button? I can help you look. I don't know if I can work while it's playing, I insisted. I also wasn't sure if I'd get some sort of copyright issue on TikTok. No, we've never turned the music off. It messes with the dolls. There was a slight pause. Mechanics. I'm not sure about the specifics, but many are old animatronics, and the music plays a big part. But if you need to pause a doll while you work on it, you just need to press the IMBs, individual mechanism buttons. There was nothing too strange about the first evening. I'd never been to Disneyland before, so I was completely unaware that the song's language had changed for each area. I managed to get just over a dozen of the dolls preened and cleaned, meaning that I could move from the frozen North Pole section to Scandinavia. A few people that joined my stream enjoyed the process, and with my phone on a tripod, I was able to work efficiently. As expected, a majority of viewers had complained about the song, so much so that I had to pin a comment explaining that I couldn't turn it off. A strange thing was that some of the dolls had a weird goo at the top of their head, as some sort of brownish bonding agent hadn't mixed well with the humidity. I scanned the Scandinavian section for a moment and took in the details. From beautiful and traditional dresses to unique hats, it looked magical. I could tell which dolls had a lot of movement from the number of flyaway hairs. However, there was one doll that didn't remain static. In the distance, on top of a crescent moon in the air, sat three dolls. In the center, a blonde doll's head moved right to left on a loop, as if surveying the area. I had attempted to show the viewers, but I caught a looming Louise standing at the door to the section. Mr. Haberstro, Louise called out. She was no longer in a uniform, but her hair was still neatly tied back. She remained at the door to the attraction, almost like she refused to come in. I didn't blame her though. One misstep and you'd probably fall. I pulled my phone down and looked towards Louise. I swallowed a flat glob of spit back down to my throat and replied with a strange, Mm-hmm. Sorry to disturb you, but it's 3am. I was told I had to guide you back to your room before I could clock out. She yawned. I gathered my gear in a rush, careful not to knock over anything in the set. Had she noticed? No, Louise, I'm sorry, let's go. The next night, I came prepared, with earbuds designed for married couples to drown out their partner's snores, but nothing could cancel out the cheery song. It was so useless that I ripped them at the beginning. The earbuds were better used as an expensive cotton swab, great for those hard-to-hit spots. Once again, Louise watched me from the door for a few moments. How many nights do you think it'll take you? She asked curiously. Hmm, with this many dolls, it could be two weeks, maybe more. I shrugged. I used the dull pair of scissors to snip away the elastic bands around the doll's hair. Louise allowed the tune to fill the silence for a couple of seconds before saying goodbye and leaving. I once again set up my phone. If the CIA wanted a new torture method, boy, do I have one for them. The tune to It's a Small World is endearing for a short while, but it becomes increasingly annoying. Imagine just how much I wanted to rip my hair out after an hour. I was surprised that my viewers continued to increase. I talked through another doll and changed the angle to show the three dolls on the moon again. However, I was surprised to see the center one sat static again. That's strange, I hummed. Perhaps she needs repairs. I think it's one of the older dolls. She's pretty though. I moved the phone to point at the other dolls and began to work on another that needed a trim. Something as simple as a snip takes a lot of time, as you need to be careful. I'll have to ask for a ladder tomorrow. Maybe we'll get a good view from up there. Nearing the night's end, I noticed the dull pair of scissors had gone missing. 
I had come across them on the track with some extreme looking and a brilliant suggestion to use a torch. Embarrassed by my mistake and the idea that I may have dropped them while the earbuds were in, I grew extremely flushed. You can't record in here, Mackenzie, Louise spluttered in a panic. I almost dropped the scissors at her voice. You can take pictures, but you need to delete that video. Although it was the demand, it seemed like she was regurgitating someone else's words, and like a child being scolded, I stuttered to speak. It's, uh, a live stream. End it. End it now. She was desperate. I quickly followed a word and closed the live stream. Is it off? I nodded. You can't do that. They're shy. Louise glanced up at the moon and her eyes changed for a split second before she let out a small chuckle indicating that she was joking. Hey, you head back. I need to close up. She smiled and I obliged. Don't worry, I won't tell them. Disney probably safety checked the ride each morning, but I couldn't help but think of the scissors causing a crash or flinging into somebody's face. The fact that I could have killed somebody kept me up alongside the mass messages of an edited screenshot of the moon dolls. The most annoying part was that it was sent from many accounts. A stupid joke, but one freaky enough to make me not want to be there alone. On further inspection, the middle doll had been staring at the camera. Something its mechanism shouldn't have allowed it to do. I managed to sleep through the day. The warm sun illuminated the room softly and protected me from anything looming in the shadows and allowed my overactive brain to relax. I'd managed to wash up, feed myself and play on my phone for a bit until there was a knock at my door. Mr. Haberstro, I'm here to escort you. A male voice trickled in from the cracks beneath the door. I hesitated to answer and crept to the door. Where's Louise? I asked. She transferred to a different department, he informed, and I peeped through the spy hole. In front of the door was a young gentleman in his early twenties. Despite his age, he seemed confident in himself. It was weird since she didn't mention transferring. Maybe she forgot. Mr. Darwin asked me to escort you from now on. He beamed as if he knew I was looking at him. So I opened the door and he handed me the doll profile book. You left this last night. The walk to the ride felt shorter than ever. Michael and I got along swimmingly and he shared stories of his little sister's fascination with dolls which she had gotten from their older sister. I was wrong to be suspicious of him. Hey Michael, do you know how to turn the music off? I tried. Oh, it doesn't turn off. The dolls have to stay active, which means the music stays on. He informed me. The reply was similar to Louise's. I decided not to work on the moon dolls that session, as the middle one had disappeared. Maybe for repairs. Pushing my luck, I set up another stream and started by showing the new section to the viewers. Strange, none of them are moving today, I noticed. It was true. The music was playing, however, the dolls were still, as if their IMBs had been pressed. I guess it makes it easier for me to work on them. Since it was an easier night, I was able to answer a few questions. I refused the disclosed location, but people quickly identified the dolls, how do you know which is which? A comment asked. Well, if you check their backs, there's this tag with a number on the back. I explained while moving to the next doll. I arrived at one which looked well kept and searched for the tag. Oh, this one doesn't have one. I showed the front of the doll to the camera. Her mousy blonde hair hung straight, but the strange brown goo had begun to seep from the scalp. She must have lost the tag. I took the time to clear the smelly goop and tied the hair back, careful not to ruin the yarn. Just as I was about to switch to another doll, I noticed the liquid had started to seep out of one of her eyes. I quickly wiped it with a cloth, turning the material a maroon color. Maybe it's some sort of wood glue or something. 
I swapped another doll, which was dressed up as Alice from Alice in Wonderland, and pulled out the tag to show it. Number 32. So, if I search through my book for 32, it'll show me a reference. I grinned. I can't show you though, or I'll get into trouble, but I bet you can guess who she was meant to look like. I learned from previous mistakes and stopped my stream before three, which was good judgement because Michael appeared right on time. How's it going? He smiled. Peachy, I found one without a tag though. Who do I report it to? I pointed out the doll to him. Oh, I'll look into it. Belladonna was back the next night and the dolls were back in motion. It seemed the further along I got, the lazier the dolls became. I couldn't help but wonder if the mechanics got burnt out after being on 24-7. Michael was able to get me a ladder, but he seemed to linger around, meaning I couldn't stream. I climbed up the ladder and placed my toolbox at the top. There was no room for the book, so it meant I had to climb back down to double check my work. Did you find out what number the doll was? I tied his hair back, but I'm worried it had a certain style, I asked him taking extra care to trim the yarn of the first doll while so high up. Um, Michael hummed. I'm not sure. Do you want to come and check with me? I know where the right plans are, he mentioned. Like, right now? With my rising viewage, I didn't want to start my stream too late. It felt like I had people expecting me for once. When you're done with that. I took a look at Belladonna and pressed the IMB. Something clicked and it allowed her head to move back and forth again. Although I hadn't worked on her yet, I didn't want to jam the mechanics for too long for fear of breaking her. Michael took me to the back room area for the ride, somewhere I never expected to be. He rummaged around as if he knew what he should be looking for, but not where it was. I heard that they keep an updated plan from the Imagineer somewhere. Every other ride I worked on had one. They used updated when there were any changes. He shoveled around until he got to the last drawer. Oh, what is it? This one was last updated in 2006. Disappointment alongside something else I couldn't pinpoint goaded his voice. I watched as he took out the previous plan and waited for him to examine them. Mr. Haberstro, what do you think about the ride? He asked. I mean, it's cute. I struggle to place an opinion on it. Kind of strange, I don't know. My older sister used to love this ride. When she turned 18, I remember she got a Disney pass so she could come and look at all the dolls. I raised the brow, feeling like I was in the wrong place. I was only 8 at the time. Yeah, I replied. Let's head back. A lot of the dolls aren't even on here especially the new one. Did you check down the shirt for the tag? No, I guess I didn't check properly. For some reason, Michael kept hold of the ride plan and followed me out. We navigated towards the mysterious doll across the ride, and I noticed the new tag hanging out of its shirt. Just as I went to reach it, a huge crash echoed throughout the tunnel. The sound of clashing metal sent both Michael and me jumping out of our skin. Michael screamed a few curse words and quickly corrected himself. It seemed like he hadn't fully grasped the cast member personality just yet. Sorry, he apologised. We turned the slight corner around to see my toolbox on the ground. The ladder, however, was still in place. I guess I should be the one that's sorry. I should have taken it down with me. Unfortunately, Bottles of cleaners and tonics had smashed across the track. I hopped down and tried to clear the bigger pieces while Michael grabbed a broom. I loaded the bigger chunks into the now liquid soaked piece of cloth, but a much smaller piece impaled my finger in the process. It didn't cause much harm, but I was a baby about pulling it out. When Michael came back, he helped me remove it, and I used the cloth to stop the bleeding while he retrieved the first aid kit. The liquid on the fabric stung and turned my blood a dark colour. It wasn't one of my best ideas to use something soaked in cleaning fluid as a gauze. When Michael came back, he took it upon himself to disinfect and bandage the wound. Despite everything, 
I was stuck staring at the cloth. Michael followed my gaze to the cloth and hissed under his breath. You lost all that blood? No, just a bit. Those big stains are from the dolls, I huffed. Why would dolls bleed? He asked, confused. I mean, I'm not a doll expert, but... It wasn't blood. It was a weird goop. It may have been glue or something reacting with the rusty mechanisms. Now that I said it out loud, it did sound stupid. Which dolls? He asked. Quite a few. The one we're at had some. Michael grabbed the scissors from the ground and rushed over to the newly tagged doll. I scrambled behind him, desperate to keep up. What did she look like? He shook. She? She, the person before me, Louise. Michael rushed his words out. His panic had started to infect me. Uh, she had almost brown hair, mousy blonde, dark circles. I don't know. I draped over my words. Look at it. Although his voice was weak, his sentence was demanding. And I did as I was told. At first, it didn't make sense. The doll in front of me was frail looking, skinny, with less yarn than they gave the rest. Sure, the hair colour was the same, but that didn't mean anything. You're not suggesting, I trailed off. It was so ridiculous that I couldn't finish my sentence. Cleaning fluid had formaldehyde in it. Do you know what it's also used for? He asked. Scissors gripped so hard in his hands that his fingers were turning white. When I failed to answer, he did it for me. They embalm with it. It reacts with blood too. It's even used in disinfectant wipes. I had caught onto parts of his accusation even more now. But if it was embalmed, why would it leak? I don't know, a bad job maybe? Michael raised the scissors, ready to stab into the doll, and I threw myself in front of him. Stop, this is stupid, you can't destroy it, you have no proof. Michael stopped, lowered his arms and paused for a minute. He pulled the folded ride plan out of his pocket and opened it up. Do you remember which dolls had the goo? Circle them. I stared at the plan for longer than I wanted to. It took me a few moments to decipher it. Well, I can't, I admitted. They're not on here. Only the moon one is. Show me the page for it. Michael followed me back to the doll portfolio. It was already open on Belladonna's, ready for a fix-up. Hers, I handed him the book, which he took. I watched as a tan Michael turned pale as a sheet. His appearance became incredibly sickly, and his lack of reaction worried me. Finally, he shook out a breath and swallowed. He shakily handed me back the book and sat on the wet track. Michael began to sob into his knees aggressively, and once again, I stood in fright of the strange man. It wasn't until I crouched down to his height to comfort him that I managed to hear what he was crying out. Donna, Donna, Donna. He sobbed. His voice cracked and his words broke from his tears. Donna? Bella Donna? I asked. And he only sobbed harder. I couldn't get an explanation out of him for a long time. We sat on the tracks, soaking our trousers in leftover bromine residue. I had no idea how to deal with somebody so unbelievably upset that all I could do was take the scissors off of him, drop them, and wait. When he finally calmed down, I glanced up at the doll on the moon, returning the stare. Pinpricks of fear stabbed my body as I locked eyes with her, but she didn't move. My sister, Donna, she went missing here. My parents never told me what happened, but I became obsessed with her disappearance a few years back. The police never figured it out, and she apparently checked out of the park, so it wasn't the park's responsibility. I felt uncomfortable, but I heard him out. They think they found her body, but her face was mangled. Her eyes, teeth and fingertips were missing, but it had a bracelet. My parents couldn't confirm it was her, but we buried it anyway. I wrapped my arm around him and pulled him into an embrace. His wet cheeks pressed against mine, Bella Donna is what a cast member used to call her. I rewatched old home videos recently. He wasn't too old. He had maybe a few years on her. 
probably my age, Pretty Donna. I watch Michael stand up and head to the ladders. His shaky frame climbed it towards the doll. I didn't have the heart to stop him. He ripped it from its frame and carried it down. Brown goo leaked from its eyes, but it remained completely static. Mom and Dad always said you go after anyone who gave you attention. You were born to be adored. He whispered and wiped her eyes with his sleeve. In an unexpected feat, Michael, who had grabbed the scissors off the floor, stabbed the doll's face. Brown sludge dripped from the hole, and white as stones fell to the ground alongside it. Teeth. All around us, the dolls began to leak, their bodies motionless, and the music stopped. This was a favorite ride. He sobbed and embraced the doll, staining his uniform with the liquid. I watched as he mourned for a long time, the relief of finding out what happened to his sister, but the pain of losing her again had reopened wounds that had once healed. Michael and I both left in my car, however, my phone won't stop ringing. I have blocked Mr. Darwin's number, but I keep getting calls from random and unknown numbers. Michael told me not to answer. I was hired by Disney to cut the hair of the It's a Small World dolls because their hair grows yearly. And now I fear that my life is in danger. The round red button starts it all. A lens, an all-seeing eye. A flashing light blinks as the display shows the souls of the innocent, the guilty and the deceptive. One can see all the little movements, the subtle muscle impressions made by the face that we don't always see, the tiniest hint of discomfort, joy or perplexion. One is the omniscient behind the eye of the lens, always watching, hidden in plain sight. The hilarity and ironic value of these facts is realized when the wider perspective is shown. Once you zoom the camera out, so to speak, for when you do, you will see more than the video camera situated on a tripod. You'll see me. If I were to tell someone about what I'm actually doing behind my camera, they'd likely call me a voyeur, some sort of deviant. I would be little more than a fiend to them. But they'd be terribly, terribly wrong. The ignorance of such words is funny, because a single glimpse into what I see will be more than enough to quell the comments. The irony presents itself in that one might expect those who like to spy, to pry and peep, to invade privacy and to learn more about people than they know of themselves, to be in prison, or at least to be in the darkest depths of society where they cannot act out these fantasies as brazenly. But again, they'd be so utterly wrong. I get paid for it. Even more bizarrely, people trust me in public settings. So, I would implore one to truly assess the situation with me. Here I am, standing at the back of a dining room of a wedding reception, my little blinking light documenting everything that goes on. I've been allowed in this place, hired even. It's wondrous how easy infiltration is. Mr. and Mrs. Anderson, the newlyweds, are currently on the dance floor drunk and disorderly. The ceremony was rather interesting. I videoed that too, drinking in each and every little expression they made as they said their vows. My zoom captures so much. It's utterly fascinating. Every blemish was in full focus as I slowly zoomed inwards to rest on Mrs. Anderson's face. Outside of the camera, she's a woman in a prime, 25 and earning five figures, truly a role model and a striking person. But the camera doesn't lie, and I could see it all. I saw the wincing she made as the vows were recited in front of her. I saw she slipped on the ring, how her fingers shook. Underneath it all, she's a rusted and worn has-been. The soul of an old maid inhabits a youthful body. And Mr. Anderson, the personal trainer, 
I saw that twinkling smile as they were pronounced husband and wife. The one he likely wears when he hits her too. I know he's a sadist. It takes one to know one. That chiseled, brown-haired man is a facade, a caricature of masculinity threatening to crumble. They show their true colours to me persistently, and I intend to capture it all. They're doing it now, as they celebrate their marriage to the tune of losing my religion on the dance floor. My lens is trained on them, the subtle discomfort when he touches a waist, the desire to peel away. He wishes she was more drunk, maybe then she'd make him excited. I pan away for a few moments, surveying the guests at the tables, analysing their movements, the gestures, making for interesting pieces of this puzzle. Sarah, the sister, sits to my left, arms expressing a story she's recounting. I can zoom towards a made-up face, watching the intricacies of the laugh lines upon the face move. It's focused with her in frame now, and separate from the other hubbub in the room. I watch her lips, hearing the sounds when I really concentrate on her. She's talking about a childhood story. Her and Mrs. Shirley Anderson had an altercation. Some sort of comedic value involved when the former fell over while arguing as children. The words don't matter though. Not as much as a face. The twitch as she mentions her sister's name. Small, tiny lip movements when accepting compliments about her sister's husband. She knows quite a lot. Next, the blinking recording device shifts to the table to the right, where Mrs. Anderson's close friends are all situated, settling on one in particular. A lean man, mousy hair, mild-mannered and polite, as he shares a joke with his peers. As I zoom, I notice his eyes flitting to the newlyweds on occasion, struggling to engage with his fellow friends as his focus is drawn elsewhere. Marcus is his name. His words are caught by my ears as I watch his lips with intense interest as he talks once more. Something about the Andersons being drunk, that he'd like to go for another drink soon. Perhaps he might dance soon. It seems the idea of being up on that dance floor makes him happy. His expression seems to soften as he moves his gaze once more aimed at the dance floor, towards the new Mrs. Anderson. And that fleeting hint of apprehension as his eyes move from bride to groom. I know quite a lot now. Of course, they're none the wiser. I'm just here to document their event. At long last, the party is over. I begin to pack my things away, ready to head home, alone in the room but for one. He comes up to me. Paul Anderson in his navy suit, red tie and brown shoes. Even without the lens, I can see his grandiosity is but an illusion. You did just as I asked. Well done for not getting in the way too much. I nod and smile, replying as I continue to put my things away. No problem, I'm just an observer. That's all, right? The man returns with a jovial smile and heads out of the room, the tapping of his feet audible as he goes. I wasn't lying. I am simply just an observer. My laptop displays the contents of the video, ready for editing, displayed in full. I watch intently at the screen, eyes fixated on each and every change in expression, reveling in the documentation I have of each interaction. I play back the scenes like a movie, stitching together my narrative. I have created a fall from grace. A ceremony with the snapshots of the couple, all smiles and the fragility they both bring. Next, the meal. Morsels swallowed down in small mouthfuls. Mrs. Anderson's apprehensiveness to eat in full view, her husband looking a little too intently at her as she swallows, just for a second. And of course, the dance. The dance is the best part yet. The trailing of his hands up her body as they dance to the rhythm. Her face full of telltale reluctance and tolerance. That's what she is really. A woman of tolerance. The music just makes it all in shroud of celebration. Eyes locked as she tries to break away. His arm keeping her firmly in place. 
Why do I care so much about people I hardly know? Their plight is the most interesting part. The fascination lies in their unspoken language, the words they share with no sounds. I know so much about them through my third eye, and they hired me, so I must finish their story. The last part has yet to be completed. The fall from serenity to boiling point is there, but their ending has been untold. I don't usually break my own rules, but the Andersons have really enthralled me today. And so, as I switch tabs to my camera feed monitor, a small sigh escapes my lips. They're sleeping so soundly, not a single peep. Naturally, they're not embracing, but it's serene sleep nonetheless. I switch them off as I leave, my long coat following me as I go. This ending requires more than just watching. A more personal touch is required. Strolling through the darkness is where I enjoy life. The cold air in my face as I trudge along the hard sidewalks of the sleeping city. I cast my mind back to the pre-wedding meeting. Miss Shirley Roberts, as she'd been known before Paul became a husband, sat in front of me in their nice tidy lounge, discussing the details of their celebration, what I'd need to bring, pricing and such. I'd had the measure of them before they'd even started talking. The touching and locking eyes were too performative, as if both were trying to fool one another. Their story was begging to be told. And here I am, once again, at the abode they'd allowed me into, both knowingly and unknowingly. I creep into the backyard, duplicate house key in my left hand and the other key in my right. Advancing up the stairs is a slow process. Every sound I make risks waking the two slumbering protagonists in my narrative. I make my way, ascending with careful footing. I hear soft breathing as I near the top, a mumble and a shift in position. Good, they're still asleep. I'm inside the room now, inches away from my muses. My hand is shaking a little as I place the folder in my right hand in between the two sleeping subjects. I switch my eyes and ears in the house on before I retire to bed, the anticipation of what's to come making sleep difficult. Whoever wakes first will finish my story. I'm not disappointed, not at all. I'm in utter, unadulterated wonder. The camera feed displays blood-soaked sheets sprawled on the floor, fresh from a morning struggle. Two equally disorganized bodies lie parallel to each other with a blade by Shirley's hand, cadavers leaking the very same liquid the bed is coated with, and just to their left lies an open folder, a picture of a slight, mousy-haired man, and a note scattered not far from it. I begin to look over the footage from the beginning of the morning, watching the resulting skirmish that the two could not have ever foreseen, the awakening of Paul Anderson, his hands opening my gift the realization, and of course, the mad rage-induced onslaught with a now-discarded blade. I have outdone myself. My predictions were once again correct. I know these people better than they know themselves. I know their thoughts. I finally allow myself a smile. My work is done. Now, all that's left is to finish the video to complete the happiest day of their lives. My ending couldn't have gone any better. So, fun fact, the author of this story has a YouTube channel where he makes audio dramas of his stories. A lot of my favorite stories on this channel was actually written by him, so if you want to see more of that, Head over to his channel and check it out. Link is in the description and the comments. Birthday balloons and objects that suggest a family-friendly version of the occult surrounded her. The collapsible table that my wife used for laundry folding was now covered in a dark red tablecloth and a crystal ball the size of my skull sat in the center of it. Shame the kids had to leave she said in a tone far too casual for a fortune teller. 
Yeah, I said, taking out my wallet. It had been a long day at work. My stepkid's birthday party had turned into an impromptu trip to the zoo, and there was a bottle of cognac waiting for me in the study. I didn't want to spend a second longer talking to the fortune teller than I had to. Real shame, she said, elating to shuffle her glossy tarot cards instead of packing up. We didn't even get to use the crystal ball. The kiddos always get a kick out of that. Ah oh well, your daughter seemed pretty interested though. If she would ever like a private session, I'd be more than happy to... You don't actually believe this stuff, do you? Aside from the sequin-covered blouse and the plastic pendants hanging from around her neck, the fortune teller looked like someone you would find strolling down the produce aisle. My question, however, seemed to have ripped her from the world of the mundane into something far more mystical. Her face twisted into a confused grimace, the grey mole beneath her eye twitched. What do you mean? She asked in a tone feigning offence. This, all of this nonsense, magic. You don't actually believe in magic, do you? I asked, pointing to the silliest object on the table. She picked up the flimsy plastic stick labelled as the magic hype predictor and left. This specifically? No, I don't think a piece of plastic can predict someone's height. That's just something I keep around for the kiddos. She dropped the stick on the table as if it was something that belonged in the recycling bin. But when her stubby fingers hovered above the crystal ball, her voice lost all track of humour. This, however, the idea that there is more to the world than what meets the eye, that I believe in, unapologetically so. She grinned. I didn't. My stepkid recently got obsessed with some show about middle school witches so hiring a fortune teller for a party seemed like a reasonable call. The birthday party would be contained to the basement. She gets to pretend magic is real and I would have peace and quiet in my study. My stepdaughter, however, also recently became obsessed with some Timmy or Tommy kid from her class. She invited him to the party. His mother dropped him off. Tommy's mother found fortune telling to be an affront to our lord and saviour. She was very vocal about it. She wasn't going to let a child be indoctrinated with the work of Satan. My daughter refused to continue her party without Timmy. All interest in crystal balls and tarot cards went down in a shrill torrent of fire and brimstone. In an effort to save the day, my wife loaded all the kids into the minivan and drove over to a nearby zoo. Tommy's mother didn't have a problem with animals in cages. Do you believe in anything? She asked, going back to mixing the tarot cards. What? I presume you're not of the same thoughts as the angry lady that was yelling about Satan a couple of minutes ago. But I'm curious. Do you believe in a higher power? Karma, perhaps? No, I said. Look, can I just pay you? I have business to attend to. Sure, she smiled politely. But she didn't stop shuffling. When I produced two $50 bills, she cocked her head to the side. That's not the amount I agreed on with your wife. That's half. We booked you for an hour. You stayed 20 minutes. Half seems reasonable to me. It might seem reasonable if you discount travel time, availability, marketing, and the gift bags I brought for your children's birthday party. She didn't budge from her seat. Instead, she cleared a layer of invisible dust from her crystal ball. The cognac bottle was calling me from my study. Hundred bucks, take it or leave it, I said. For a moment, she simply watched me, quietly making calculations of character. Then, her lips parted. How about we have ourselves a little bet, she said, her voice softening. I'll show you something, some magic, as you called it. If I convince you that there's something out there bigger than us, then I'll take your money and go. No, just take the money. The fortune teller didn't even look at the bills. She just politely smiled and went back to her tarot cards. Well, if you're not going to pay me the agreed sum, it looks like I'll just have to wait for your wife to come back home, she said with no frustration showing. After that, I became invisible to her. All of the fortune teller's attention was focused on the cards she was playing with. 
For a moment, I considered calling the cops, but I concluded that would be far too much of a hassle. I would wait. My wife has always been better at dealing with these situations anyway. The bottle from the study was calling my name, but there was no way I was going to leave someone who was interested in the occult alone in my basement. Trying to make the best of an irritating situation, I topped off my glass in the study and went back to keep an eye on the woman with the crystal ball. The fortune teller didn't even look up when I came down the stairs. Her world seemed to be completely contained to the cards she was shifting around the table. I would have rather sat in the sofa I have in the study, but the amber liquid in my glass made the stairs comfortable enough. With each sip of my drink, the stress from the workday drifted out of my chest. Even the presence of the fortune teller and a tacky decor ceased to bother me. I was starting to properly enjoy my drink. But then, she spoke up again. Is your faith ever shaken? The fortune teller asked, clearing a tarot card into a single deck. There has to be at least a tiny part of you that has doubt. How naive is it to think that we understand all of this? She spread out her arms as if my cramped basement was the most complex mystery in the universe. What are you talking about? A wager, she said, smiling. You look like a man who would prefer to drink without my company, and I would like to be elsewhere as well. All it would take is a couple of minutes of your time. Or, if you want me out of your house even faster, just give me my $200. The smell of laundry detergent was sneaking hints of dish soap into my drink. I knew the glass was clean. I knew the cognac was good. Yet, the aftertaste was still there. What happens if you do convince me that magic is real? So you do have doubts? No, I just want to know what I'm signing up for. If I convince you there's something more to this world than meets the eye, then I will take the $100 and leave. She pushed one of the children's chairs out from behind the table and beckoned me to sit down. So, what do you get from convincing me? A feeling of self-satisfaction. As she grinned, the grey mole beneath her eye became almost imperceptible. That's why we do most of the things we do, right? I didn't want to argue another abstract point with her. I just wanted to enjoy my drink in peace. As I sat down at the table, all of the fortune teller's tchotchka were cleared away, leaving nothing but the oversized crystal ball. She reached across the table and took my hand in her stubby fingers. Now, could I ask you to breathe on the crystal ball? The object in front of me looked less like a window to the realm of the supernatural and more like a shell of someone's ornate porch light. But the moment I exhaled, the ball filled with fog. The single breath of waxy liqueur had summoned a restless cloud of dark smoke. The fortune teller squeezed my hands tight. Beyond the screen of darkness, something twitched. You've felt it before, she said, her voice grown dark. That feeling of being watched, of being observed. You might have shrugged it off as an intrusive thought, or as a twitch of your imagination. But it was instinct. You felt it before. You knew the explanation wasn't as simple as you wanted to believe. Her stout fingers dug into my palm. You should have given me the money. The colourful birthday balloons behind the fortune teller had become mere blurs. Her eyes had grown pale, the dark mole on her cheeks spread like a cigarette burn carving through upholstery. Look inside of the crystal ball and see what you've convinced yourself doesn't exist. A pair of bulging, milky eyeballs stared at me from the dark clouds. They shivered in anticipation as if they were ready to burst and splatter all across the crystal barrier that divided us. They watched me. They watched me just like they had before. The memory of the eyes rushed into my mind violently and with no remorse. It was dark. I was an infant. The walls of my crib were impossibly tall and they hovered over me. Shapeless creatures of darkness stood over me with eyes of cruel moons. I could scarcely comprehend the world around me. 
but I knew those white-eyed beings meant me harm. I screamed. My pitiful eyes did nothing to fend off the incomprehensible shadows that hovered over me. I screamed until the lights turned on and my mother appeared. She held me to her chest, trying to calm me, telling me that there was nothing to be scared of. You were lied to. You were tricked. Your understanding of the world has been crippled by confidence and fetishism of the unmeasurable. Her fingers traveled down my wrist like a spider covered in ice. Beyond the crystal ball, I could see her leaning towards me, her face shifting in the sudden dimness. Yet, I couldn't look away from those two globes of dripping white. I must have been around six. Me and my older cousin went exploring in the woods near our grandfather's cabin. We found an ancient drainage pipe that led to a world of darkness. My cousin wanted to explore it. He insisted, but I refused. I couldn't. I couldn't go in there. They were watching me. Kids teach themselves to forget. They ignore the unexplainable. They force themselves into blindness to make the world more palatable. But their eyes are still there. They just need to be reminded. All it takes is a hint and they can see the truth once more. Frozen daggers which drew no blood were crawling on my forearms. I pried my eyes away from the crystal ball and looked up at the fortune teller. My cry of terror came out as a pathetic gurgle tasting of cognac and spit. She had become completely shapeless. Her fingers writhed like trails of dust in a tornado. Her body seemed to exist purely as a trick of the fluorescent lights that hung above us. All was shapeless but her eyes. They pulsed above me. Two massive chunks of malicious flesh. Last week, my stepdaughter woke us up crying, saying that there was a monster hiding in her closet. My wife and I went to a bedroom to comfort her, to tell her that there are no such things as monsters. But when the little girl insisted that I check around her coats to make sure there are no creatures waiting to harm her, I refused. At the time, I didn't know why I wanted to stay away from the darkness of the closet, but looking up at those vein-covered balls of light, I understood. Deep within me, I knew what was hiding inside of that closet. I just refused to accept it. With the fortune teller hovering over me, there was no denying it. How goes our wager? The words slithered out of her non-existent lips like a thousand whispers. Is your faith still unshaken? I tried to speak, but all that left my mouth was spit. My body was completely frozen in the unforgiving gale of the incomprehensible reality. All I managed to do was nod my sweaty face. She smiled a crooked grin that only existed as a trick of the light. Good. A thousand hushed voices said, I hope you learned your lesson. Beads of ice cold sweat dropped from my chin as I nodded again. I'll make sure you don't forget it. With each word that slithered out of the shadows, the eyeballs inflated further until the flesh could no longer hold. Like a balloon bursting in slow motion, tendrils of an impossible black liquid grew from ripples into waves. The darkness consumed me fully. I said nothing to my wife. It is not until now that I'm able, barely, to capture the raw terror of my encounter in words. Even if I could talk to her about this madness, if I could somehow convince her that what I'd witnessed was real, I doubt it would be of any help. I don't need emotional support. I need psychiatric evaluation or an exorcist. After the darkness passed, all traces of the fortune teller was gone. All I was left with was the remnants of an eight-year-old's birthday party and the intrusive scent of laundry detergent. The basement in which I collapsed had been completely empty, but deep in the back of my skull, there was a certainty. I knew I was being watched.
as I tell you this, I sit in my well-lit study. There is an empty bottle of cognac next to me, but it has done little to calm my mind. Outside, night has fallen. My blinds are closed, but the darkness outside is undeniable. Through the cracks, I see movement. Out there, beyond the dim lights of suburbia. Something is watching me. I fear my punishment will not be swift. It's not like my parents didn't warn me to be careful around strangers, but since my dad's sales job was, in his words, the only thing keeping us off the streets, I had to be very careful who I treated as a stranger. Auntie Lynn, for example. We only saw her a few times a year, but since she'd given my dad some kind of loan, I had to put up with a funeral parlour perfume, smoker's breath, and near constant cheek pinching and rib poking from her gnarled, creepy old fingers. Or dad's boss, Mr. Rainier, with his booming voice and bright red face and weird way of walking. He looked like the kind of big, sloppy drunk who just might toss a kid in the air for kicks, then try to catch him and miss. Even so, it was, Yes, sir, Mr. Rainier, and thank you for teaching me to shake hands properly, Mr. Rainier, each time he came around. Strangers, I learned, could be people who dressed weird or lived on the other side of town. They could be people who smelled funny or whose skin was a different colour than ours. They could be people who talked too much or too little, or people who had a lot of bumper stickers on their car. But they definitely weren't people with money. When I told my grandpa about my parents' odd definition of strangers, he just scoffed. Sounds like a bunch of crap to me. I remember how much my mouth popped open at that word. Grandpa never cursed. He was a strict Southern Baptist, as skinny and hard as the hickory he whittled on his trailer's front porch. That day, he put down his carving and bent down till his weathered blue eyes were looking into mine. Listen, Sonny, at your age, you got what I call kid sense. It's something you lose when you get older. Not sure why. Maybe he gets replaced by other things. But the fact is, if something don't feel right to you, there's always a reason. It might not always be a good reason, like when you were scared of my hound dog just because he's big and shaggy and has one blind eye. But there's always a reason. Always. You listen to your kid sense. If it tells you to run, you get out of there quick. Got it? I thought I knew what Grandpa meant. I wasn't totally sure, but I nodded anyway. My parents came to pick me up a few minutes later, complaining about what the gravel roads were doing to the BMW. I made a new friend that summer. His name was Oliver, and he met almost all of my parents' qualifications for being a stranger. We met on a half-abandoned basketball court halfway between his school and mine. I was shooting hoops alone and feeling sorry for myself because my friends had kicked me out of the game of skunk, and Oliver, well, I guess he was just exploring the neighborhood. He was about my age, and we hit it off right away. We shot hoops together until sunset. As the sun sank below the trees, my heart sank as well. I got along with this kid way better than any of my so-called friends, but how would I ever see him again? I knew my parents wouldn't want me to hang out with a kid like him. And yet... I guess I gotta get home, I sighed. I wish we lived closer together. You kidding? Oliver laughed. Where you live? Meadowbrook Heights? That's nothing. 219A. Home of the King, baby. Through the woods. I was sure I hadn't heard right. Yeah. Oliver looked at me like maybe the basketball had hit me in the head too many times. You can take the abandoned railroad tracks, or one of the trails the animals make that connect to the power lines. Look. He pointed to a break in the gloomy woods. One of them even comes out on this court. I mean, how do you think I was going to get back? I mean... I looked around. 
the street lights might come on at any second, and then I'd really be screwed. But... Isn't it kind of... I don't know... Dark? Oliver grinned and stuck his chin out proudly. I ain't afraid of no ghosts. In that moment, he became the coolest kid I'd ever met. We decided to meet that Saturday. I tell my parents I was going to play basketball with the friends they already knew, but my real plan was to sneak through the woods to 219A, home of the king, baby. Looking at the tiny trail and the overgrown shadows of the woods, though, I felt a lot less confident. I'd already followed the power lines just like Oliver had said, slapping the ticks off as I slogged through the shoulder-high summer grass. The absence of people was starting to freak me out a little. In Meadowbrook Heights, there was always somebody around. The postman delivering mail, the neighbours mowing their lawn, those annoying toddlers two houses down spraying each other with a garden hose. But out here, there was nobody. If my kid sense kicked in out here, who would I run to? I told myself that I was just being a big baby. After all, didn't Oliver make this walk in the dark? Even so, it wasn't much of a trail. More like a thin line of grass flattened over time. Who or what had come through here so often and why, I couldn't even guess. As I walked into the wall of green, I thought about the abandoned railroad tracks Oliver had mentioned. Hadn't my dad always said that drug addicts and crazy homeless people hung out in places like that? The nasty tissues and rusted beer cans in the bushes started to seem sinister. Even worse, I realised there wasn't just one trail through the woods. There were dozens of them. If I took the wrong one and got lost... I paused. Oliver had said, straight through the woods. So straight was how I went. I'm not sure if the little path became clearer, or I got used to it, but soon I was actually enjoying the weird chunk of undeveloped land. There was a little blue pond, colourful dragonflies like I'd never seen before, an emerald clearing with rings of tiny red mushrooms. In no time at all, I was overlooking the gloomy, colourless buildings of Dunbar Apartments. I'd made it. I whooped and ran down the hill. Before I did though, I had the strangest feeling, like I was being watched from just inside the woods, but I shook it off and hurried to meet my new friend. We had a great time, right up until I left. Oliver had planned on walking me to the edge of the woods, but a shadow fell over us as we stepped outside the door to 219A. Excuse me, the man towering over us had wavy white hair. His eyes were as bright and uncanny as his emerald green suit. A gold chain hung from his vest and gold rings twinkled on his fingers. Now here was a guy with money. Would you fine young men mind helping me out? Fine young men, I liked that. What you need, Oliver offered. I'm a manager of sorts, you see. He gestured to the dilapidated bare door of 219B and I need to get inside this empty apartment. Unfortunately, I'm not as strong as I used to be, and the door appears to be stuck shut. Why don't you two fine young men open it for me? Oliver and I looked at each other. The man in green drummed his fingers on his thigh. Impatiently, hungrily, I thought. Suddenly, I knew I didn't want to be in any apartment alone with this guy, and I knew exactly what my grandpa had meant earlier that summer. I actually gotta be getting home, sorry. I grabbed Oliver's wrist and tugged toward the staircase. Young man, the commanding tone stopped me in my tracks. It was exactly like my father's. As he spoke, the man in green had positioned himself between us and Oliver's apartment. Our only other means of escape. I am a manager and I haven't given you permission to go yet. All I need is your help with a small task... There's no harm in that, is there? I can pay you. The man counted some coins, and Oliver's eyes lit up. I tightened my grip on Oliver's wrist. Well, you can pay somebody else. We gotta go, sorry. I took off before Oliver could protest, and didn't stop until we were back on top of the hill. What the hell, man? 
Oliver panted. Didn't you get a weird vibe from that guy? I demanded. Well, yeah, Oliver shrugged. But like my old man says, a dollar is a dollar. Besides, even if he was sketchy, what's he gonna do? There's two of us. I don't know, I grimaced. I don't want to know. A truck horn honked, and an older version of Oliver waved at us with a big toothy grin. That's my dad, Oliver sighed. He'd put on a brave face, but I could tell he was just as relieved as I was to see an adult other than the man in green. You gotta get back before your folks get suspicious. I'll ask my dad about that guy. Don't worry. Oliver punched my arm. I'll be safe now. Okay, I chuckled nervously. Straight back through the woods, just like you said. Oliver gave me an odd look. No man, from Meadowbrook Heights, you go straight to the power lines and then take two lefts. Oliver's dad honked again, and my friend gave me a final wave as he headed down the hill. It had gotten cloudy, and I wasn't sure if there was a chill in the air or in my bones. All I knew for sure was that I did not want to go into those woods again. If I didn't though, I'd be grounded for sure. Facing my dad when he was angry was the scariest thing I could imagine. Even scarier than that weird, wide-eyed man in green. With a sigh, I set off down the trail. Okay, if it should have been two lefts before, this time it should be two rights. It was dimmer in the forest this time, so dim I almost missed my turn. Almost. Trying not to get lost kept me on edge, to the point that I jumped at the slightest sound. A bird cooing, skittering in the bushes. I almost didn't recognize the little blue pond, but the clearing felt familiar, and I knew I'd seen those circles of red mushrooms before. I scratched my head. It didn't make sense. How had I ended up back in this spot? Oh, hello there, young man. I recognized the voice even without turning around. The creepy old man from the hallway. How had he beaten me here? His bright green suit was immaculate, even though he was sitting on a rotted log beside the pond. Golden beams of sunset coming through the clouds turned his hair of white golden and illuminated the hand-woven basket beside him, full of plump and delicious looking red fruits I didn't recognize. Meadowbrook Heights suddenly felt very far away. The man in green must have noticed the look on my face because he leaned forward with a big, wide-eyed grin that made my hair stand on end. What a surprise to see you again. I thought you were in a hurry. I was, I corrected myself quickly. I mean, I am, so... Then, why did you come back here? He raised a bushy eyebrow. I didn't have an answer for that. Well, now that you've come, why didn't you share some of these fruits with me? They grow here, you know, and they're perfectly safe to eat. He popped one into his mouth, and then the red juice ran down his wizened chin like blood. Here, take one. I took a step backward. How had he gotten so close? It's rude not to take us off to you, young man. You know that, don't you? You don't even have to eat it if you don't want to. Take it home as a gift for your mom and dad. You can tell them you met the manager. They'd like that, wouldn't they? And then you wouldn't be in so much trouble if word got back to them about your friend. The man in Green's voice had a hypnotic, sing-song quality. As he spoke, I felt the tips of my toes dragging over the wet grass as it reeled me closer and closer to him. There couldn't be any harm in taking just one, right? But then, a strange thing happened. The crimson berries in the man's hand, which just seemed so delicious and bright from far away, looked a lot more like tiny, rotten mushrooms up close. Kid sense. I thought about Grandpa and stopped my hand mid-reach. I don't care if it's rude, I said flatly. I don't care if I get into trouble. I'm going home, and I know my way back. The man in green's face melted into a red mask of rage and then put itself back together in a way that was horrifying to see. But I didn't stick around for what might happen next. I was out of there, sprinting faster than I ever had on the basketball court. 
The streetlights were already on by the time I got back to Meadowbrook Heights. The yards and sidewalks were empty and blue in the twilight. All the families were inside and sitting down to dinner together, except mine. I was going to be in so much trouble. My clothes were filthy and shredded by the woods. I shivered as sweat began to cool on my skin. Just two more streets, I told myself. He was approaching from the opposite direction. Even before I felt my stomach drop, I knew who it was. My jellied legs didn't have the strength to beat him to my parents' house. The gold of his rings and watch chain sparkled in what was left of the light. The man in green stopped just in front of my parents' driveway. Just like before, I found myself moving toward him almost against my will. It was like sleepwalking. You've been a very bad young man. The man in green crossed his arms. His victory smile was like a razor blade. Trespassing in the woods, spending time in a stranger's apartment, lying to your parents. But I'm going to give you one last chance. If you will but tell me your name, I'll ask your father to be lenient when I tell him what you've done. I felt a burst of anger. There was something wrong with the man in green, and I knew it. Even if my father and other adults couldn't see it, I knew it. It was true for me, and I wasn't going to let anyone else decide my truth anymore. Who was a stranger and who wasn't? Who was an enemy and who was a friend? Oliver was my friend. The man in green was my enemy, and no amount of punishment was going to change that. I snapped out of it when the man in green's fingers were just inches away from my face. I shook my head and sprinted for the front door without looking back. I slipped inside with my eyes shut and cringing, waiting for pale hands to pull me back out into the night. Yet, I locked the deadbolt and leaned against the door as easily as if I were alone. I could hear the TV on in Dad's den, plates clattering in the kitchen. A sharp knuckle rap at the door brought me back to my senses. I saw a familiar shadow in the tiny window. Tell me your name, accept my gifts, let me in. The sooner that you do that, the sooner it'll be over. I heard the words in my head over and over, like a high-speed mantra. Even though there was a wall between us, it sounded like the man in green was whispering directly into my ear. His attempts to get in were getting louder. Pounding, mashing at the doorbell, scraping his nails on the glass, slamming himself against the frame so hard the dusk shut out. And then it was over. The shadow on the doorstep was gone, but a new one appeared behind me. What on earth are you doing in the hallway? My mom swayed tipsily, backlit by the kitchen light. She had her apron on and there was a martini in her hand. Your father's working late. Dinner with clients, he says. Again, she sighed. Come on, let's get you fed. Okay, sure, I smiled to myself. I'll be right in. Just gotta do one thing first. I snuck upstairs to the phone in my parents' bedroom and called Oliver to let him know I'd made it home safe. This was not what dreams were made of. A single street of liquor stores, secondhand shops, and boarded up shelves. The old men sitting on wooden boxes playing checkers. The three-legged dog that went from stranger to stranger, hoping for a scrap of food. And the police station, that most times felt like a motel for drunks and lost souls. My station. I joined the police with a mind to becoming a detective in the big city. LA or New York. I'd solve homicides and bus cartels and hang out with beautiful women. That was 30 years ago. Now this was my beat. I was a lone cop in a one-horse town. The land was not fit for farming and there was no manufacturing or chemical plants. Not a whole lot of anything for folks who wanted to earn a living. But there was hope on the horizon. I climbed out of my patrol car, stretched and winced as my back cracked. I spent too long sitting on my backside, and when I wasn't behind the wheel or on my desk, it was propping up the bar at Marty's. 
On Tuesdays and Thursdays and Martys, the peanuts were free and any broken teeth you found in the bowl you could keep. On Fridays, there was a square dance which always ended in a brawl. So Fridays, I stayed home and watched TV. Once my back had stopped complaining at being forced into action, I looked out into the distance. It was pretty much empty, as empty as it had always been. But if things worked out, that was going to change. A big box organization that specialized in such things had won a government contract to build a supermax correctional facility, a sprawling high-tech home for the worst kind of floor breakers. And the organization wanted the site out there in the desert, within an easy truck ride of my town. There'd be money flooding in, and people, a lot of contractors during the construction itself, and then the guards and support staff. They'd need places to live and eat and let off steam. Good times, they were coming to my small town. There was just some smoothing out needed first. I climbed back into my car and drove to the mayor's office, stopping once to let Marty collect a critter that lay expired in the middle of the road. Sundays was stew night at the bar, and I often gave that a miss as well. The mayor's office lay at the western end of the high street next to the grocery store. The store's window had a display of canned goods which had not changed in all the time I had lived here and a sign saying no refunds, no credit, no spitting. The store's owner was sat in a rocking chair by the door. He nodded a greeting and I could not tell you if it was the chair or his neck which creaked. I nodded back then pushed through the fine glass doors which took you into a local seat of power. The mayor came from a long line of mayors. His father, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather had all held the position, and that seemed to suit the townsfolk just fine. The gravy train had travelled down a lot of their family lines as well. Having only lived in the town for a decade, I was still regarded by some as a newcomer, but I knew my way around. I knew my way very well indeed. I tipped my hat at the mayor's secretary. She was a fine woman with cascading brown hair and recently bereaved. I was planning on asking her if she would like to step out with me one evening and had taken to wearing deodorant on the days that I knew I would see her. I strolled on into the mayor's office. He was sat behind an impressive oak desk that came with a job, smoking a cigar and scowling at a laptop. His jowls hung limply over his shirt collar like fleshy pink drapes, and his nose was a mess of red, broken veins. The mayor had a mighty liking for the drink, and round here, that made him a man of the people. I pulled up a chair, took off my hat, and wiped the sweat from my face. He glanced up from his laptop, and drawled. We've got to get this done before they'll sign on the dotted line. I've had more emails from the organization telling me. I told you I would sort it, I replied, and if the suits that want to build this shiny new prison here are raising your blood pressure, then today is the day. The mayor's eyes narrowed as he looked at me. You'll clear out the trash. I smiled. I'll do better than clear. I'll blast it away. He nodded and showed his teeth in a tight smile. They were crooked and yellow. I wished him a good day and headed out to take care of things. It was an hour's ride to the Clunes homestead. On the blueprints I had seen, the northern perimeter fence of the proposed correctional facility would run right through their dilapidated shack and outhouses. The organization had made more than generous offer which would allow them to relocate, but the Clunes were not the moving type. This was their patch of dirt. They'd been living here, breeding here and dying here for as long as anyone could remember. The patrons in Marty said that if you dug down deep enough, you'd get to dinosaur bones, but before then, they'd be all clunes. That day, I was brandishing a holster and a badge as I marched onto their property. There was no one in sight, so I made my way round the back of the shack. The ground was littered with broken and rusty things. I took in a hoe snapped off at one end, a vicious looking scythe and a barrel full of rainwater before my eyes were drawn to a pair of ladies' underbridges hanging from a clothesline strung between two poles. 
I like to improve myself by learning new words from the three volume dictionary which took pride of place in my parlour, and the word which sprung to mind when I looked at those flimsies was voluminous. I shuddered that noticed Pa Clunes was emerging from one of the outbuildings. He was skinny as the handle of a broom, and his hair stood up coarse and bristly to complete the impression. A large clay jug dangled from his hands. It would be full of the famous Clunes moonshine, I figured, and this still must be the outbuilding. No one outside the family had ever drunk their moonshine and survived. So legend went, and I believed in legends. Pa Clunes squinted at me, and his mouth curled in displeasure. I could see he had two teeth, one on top and one directly below, enough for chewing and to inflict a nasty bite. The law ain't no authority round here, he said. You're trespassing. I stood up tall, my deputy's badge gleaming. I'm here to deliver an ultimatum, Pa. If you and your kin are not cleared from this place by sundown, then I'll be returning with the boys. Parkloon's expression hardened into a sneer. No one tells me what to do. Are those city slickers wanting to build on my land, or you with your tin badge and matching shoes? Sundown, Pa, I replied, and turned slow to show I was not scared. I started my car. My next port of call was minutes away. The organization behind the proposed prison correctional facility knew about the derelict building that was the only other thing out here in the desert. They thought it would just need demolishing. It wasn't that simple. Billy and Tommy Mulgrew were waiting for me in their custom truck next to the building. They were twins, both with a shock of red hair and freckles on their cheeks. They were born and remained conjoined at the shoulder with one arm each on the opposite side. They rarely spoke to other people and communicated with each other with glances. The townsfolk cared little about their difference, though there had been a clash when they both wanted to marry the same woman. She had been willing, but the preacher had refused. He had said it was against the will. For my part, the Mulgrew twins were strong and followed orders easily, and that was the sum of it. They gave me a little salute when they saw me, one right-handed, one left, and I returned the favour. The building alongside which we were parked up was a squat, ugly stone structure. Constructed in the 1950s, it had once been used as a holding place for prisoners working on chain gangs, saving the half day's drive back to the penitentiary. There were cells and an office for the guards. I climbed out and wandered over to the truck. Shovels lay in the back and garbage bags. I waited for Billy and Tommy to finish their smokes and break wind simultaneously, then said, Let's get this over with. The story of what happened here was no secret to the townsfolk, but it had never been shared with the outside world, because the town's business was the town's business. I must admit, as Billy and Tommy cut off the padlock on the door, I felt a twinge of unease. I heard a lot of secrets in my time as the town's lawman. I knew about the crimes that had been dealt with in the middle of the night with baseball bats and hobnail boots, about bootlegging and corruption and more, and I'd learned to live with them. But the secret of the building which we were about to enter sat very uncomfortably with me. The old metal of the padlock gave, Tommy swung open the door. The story that I had been told was that in the summer of 1951, the prisoners had been working on building the road through the desert. The heat had been vicious, and when the prisoners had glanced up at the unusual sounds of a plane passing overhead, they had shielded their eyes and seen only a blur before their guards were yelling at them to get back to it. The guards all lived in town and were known to be particularly cruel and lazy. That day, no one had reacted when the engine started to stutter, and it was only by the time that the stutter had turned into a howl and the plane was spiraling downwards that they ran, or at least the guards ran. The prisoners, still shackled, could only shuffle, and the plane crashed close to them. Before it had ground to a halt, thick smoke had begun to pour from a crack in the hull. 
The guard said the prisoners were engulfed in the smoke, and when they staggered clear of it, were choking and scratching at their eyes. The gas was not done though. It was drifting every which way, and the guards were afraid they would be caught in it. So, they herded the prisoners into the building, locked them in the cells, then got the hell away. The last thing the guards recalled was the screams of the prisoners they had left behind. The story became hazy after this. There was talk of secret experiments, there were rumours of cover-ups, of conspiracies, some involving the army, some the CIA, both in league with the mayor and lawmen of the day. Whatever the truth of the matter, the prisoners were never released. They were left to rot in the cells, and that was wrong in my opinion. A line crossed. I believed in legends, and I believed in evil, and evil had ruled this place. As I followed Billy and Timmy into the building, the air was stale and clogged with dust. Light streamed in through the barred windows. We were the first people to enter the building in the year since the plane crashed and the final incarceration of the prisoners. When the clunes were cleared off and the contract was signed, as I was determined it would be, I did not want the contractors demolishing the building to find the remains of the prisoners. That would lead to questions and more delays. No sir. We would sweep up the bones of the prisoners, toss them in the truck and find a burial place further out where they'd never be found. And the outsiders would see only termites and spiders and dirt when the bulldozers moved in. I moved along the corridor. The office was to my right. A yellow newspaper, a deck of playing cards and a pack of cigarettes sat on the desk left behind when the guards had fled. Ahead of me lay the cells. They were all empty, apart from one. The guards, in their haste to get away, must have forced all the prisoners into the first cell in the block, crammed them into the small space. The prisoners' skeletal remains were piled on top of each other. The bones of hands and wrists reached through the bars, and the lines had been scratched onto the stone floor as they desperately clawed at the ground trying to get away from the crush within was still visible. I felt nauseated, angry, but there was nothing I could do apart from get the cell emptied. I told Billy and Tommy to pick the locks. It took them long minutes, but then they were in and began to scoop the bones into the garbage bags. Then Billy grimaced. Something bit me, he exclaimed. Nothing had bitten Tommy, it seemed, but he looked pained as well due to the bond the brothers shared as he scanned the ground. There's nothing here, he said. The only thing with teeth is... He never finished. He yelped in pain. Then, holding his leg, he started to jump up and down, forcing his brother into the same clumsy jig. I peered into the cell and swore to myself. The jaws of a skull were clamped around Tommy's ankle. Get it off! Get it off! He yelled. Billy tried to kick the skull off, but it held firm. Tommy was screaming by now, and I looked on in horror as blood began to trickle from his ankle over his boot. And as an arm rose from the pile of bones that lay all around them and grasped Billy, closing its bony fingers on his wrist. His eyes widened in shock. The arm began to pull. It was trying to pull him down and he could not resist. There was nothing either of them could do, and the twins were dragged into the bones, which now rippled and rattled and shook. Fear gripped me. The remains of the prisoners were somehow moving, animated by an unnatural force that was beyond my understanding, and now the bones were crawling over Billy and Tommy, prodding and poking and piercing their skin. The spine wriggled its bony segments into Billy's open mouth and slipped down into his throat, cutting off his screams. One skeleton, complete from its waist up, dragged itself onto Tommy and bit down into his throat. Soon, I'd lost sight of the twins altogether beneath the writhing mass of bones. I was shaking and freezing cold, even though I was soaked in sweat. I had to do something. But what? I was desperately trying to think 
when I heard something scraping against the ground. I looked down and saw a skeleton dragging itself towards me. It was whole. His empty eye sockets looked at me and his jaw opened as if it was trying to speak. I turned tail and I ran. I heard things moving behind me but did not look back until I was in my car. The engine started first. I was so relieved I almost wept. I looked up, back at the building. A river of bones was dancing its way towards me, but I did not see how they would break into my car. I would make it. I would escape. I reversed and swung around. I was driving away when I saw them in my mirror. It was Billy and Tommy, which was impossible. The bones must have killed them. And yet there they were, staggering out of the building. Their skin was swollen and bruised, and in places it looked like it had been ripped away. Their clothes were torn and soaked with blood. They walked swiftly, their single arms held out in front of them, and their faces were twisted into expressions of primal rage. As I stared in horror, they screamed together, a guttural, inhuman cry that sent terror rushing through me. I floored the accelerator, but now Billy and Tommy were running. They were catching me and clambering up onto the car, holding on even though I swerved and swerved, desperately trying to throw them off. I did not see the clune shack coming up until I almost struck it. I veered at the last minute. The car rolled and I was thrown clear. Pain shot through my body, but I had no time to hesitate. I jumped to my feet and sprinted away, round the back of the shack, away from the twins. Park Loons was there. What the hell are you doing, Lawman? He yelled. I tried to tell him what was following me. Dead, I gasped. Still moving, the dead, walking, chasing, here. He shook his head, looked at me like I'd lost my mind, until he saw them behind me. I could tell from his eyes the confusion which filled them. I spun around. Billy and Tommy were staggering towards us. Billy's neck must have been snapped when the car rolled and his head hung loose to one side. Tommy was staring straight at us. His teeth were bared. I turned to Pa. They're going to kill us, I told him. And when they do, we'll be like them. My gut told me this. The part of me which believed in legends and evil. Evil which twists science and hides the truth and abandons men to die. Only when evil reigns, then there are things worse than death. Things coming closer. Things about to strike. Billy and Tommy were almost on us. Pa leapt to one side and picked up the scythe which had been lying on the ground. He swung it in looping arcs. The scythe sliced open Billy's chest and he did not flinch. Pa raised the scythe again, but slipped as he swung, and this time his blade landed on the joined shoulders of the twins, cutting clean through it. The twins staggered, moved apart. Tommy looked at his brother. Billy struggled to do the same, finally managing to twist his face towards his brother. Even through the madness which possessed their features, I could see their confusion. For the first time, the twins were separated. There were two now, not one, and it had stopped them in their tracks. Pa was the first to react. He stumbled into the outhouse where the still was. I heard hammering, then watched as a trail of thick, foul-smelling liquid began to flow out. It was the moonshine, I realized. He had broken open the still. He emerged, taking a lighter from his pocket. The moonshine had almost reached my feet. Run, he told me. I did not need telling twice and sprinted away. He followed. Billy and Tommy were still in the daze because they had split in two and stood swaying as the moonshine trickled over their feet. I heard a click, saw Pa throwing the lighter through the air. Its flame flickered. Seconds later, it landed in the moonshine, now pooling around the twins. Flames began to lick at their legs as the moonshine ignited. They howled, but they did not go down. It's not enough, I cried. 
Pa ignored me and kept his attention fixed on the ground, where, I now saw, the trail of moonshine reaching back to the still was igniting. The flames raced into the outhouse. Pa grinned, and the outhouse exploded. The twins were caught full on in the blast, and through the flames I could make out their bodies blackening and twisting as the fire consumed them. I fell to my knees in relief. Pa took a cigarette out of his pocket, tapped it on the back of his hand, leant over and lit it in the flaming pool of moonshine, and said through a mouthful of smoke, I don't like strangers on my land. This all happened about five years ago. Still, the memories of it linger and the nightmares persist. The details of everything are so clear in my mind. The sights, the smells, the feeling of my pounding heart as I run for my life, terrified. I've never spoken about this to anyone. Until now. So, here goes. The Pacific Ocean was at my back and the sound of crashing waves could be heard receding behind me as I trudged along the uphill path through the trees. The air smelled like salt water, kelp and pine needles. You're not going to believe this place, Gilbert said, walking a few paces ahead of me up the trail. He was wearing well-worn fisherman's overalls and thick rubber boots which went up to his thighs. I don't want to oversell it, but I promise you, you won't see anything like this again in your life. I didn't realise at the time what he meant by that, but I'd find out soon enough. When we came into a clearing, I saw a beautiful freshwater bay. The lake was clear and aqua blue, peaceful and utterly silent, aside from our echoing voices and the occasional call of birds in the distance. A bald eagle was perched on a nearby tree, watching us from above. Mountains stood on the horizon, their peaks haloed with mist, making the place look picturesque and stunning. My trip to British Columbia had revealed many of the most beautiful views I've ever seen, and this one topped them all. It's beautiful, I said to Gilbert, awestruck. I can't believe how clear the water is and how blue. It really is amazing. Do you see all those cottages over there? He asked in his thick French-Canadian accent. I looked around and saw several of the waterside houses, although I wouldn't call these monstrosities cottages. They were more like mansions. Most were well hidden among the trees, despite their size, with impressive decks and landscaping. Large boats sat in the water, bobbing up and down in the waves. Wow, the people in this lake must be rich. I thought you were all alone here, so far out in the middle of nowhere. Gilbert was a former chef who lived in a float house in an ocean harbour which was only accessible by boat and prop plane. It took us three hours to get there on this boat the day prior, but it had been worth it. He had an incredible setup that allowed him to live almost entirely self-sustainably, with prawn traps set everywhere, oysters galore, and some of the best fishing I'd ever seen. It was a seafood lover's paradise. He even went scuba diving for scallops. But this lake was the hidden jewel of his location, he said. These are summer houses for a lot of wealthy politicians and celebrities, actually. Believe it or not, they're empty 90% of the time, but every once in a while, someone drops in by prop plane or helicopter and spends a week on the lake. It's off-season, though, so nobody's out here right now. I'm taking care of the properties on the lake, and anybody who's coming in calls ahead so I can get it ready for them. Stocking the place with firewood, making sure the gas is on. You know, whatever needs to be done. I let out a soft whistle. That meant he had access to every one of these huge mansions and basically had free reign of their amenities for the majority of the year. Wow, this place is something else. The lake was one of the most beautiful I'd ever seen and I could understand why rich people would flock to it from afar. Mist was rising off the surface of the water and despite the grey, overcast day, I was excited by the location which was so unlike any I had seen. It looked like it was a picture from a calendar or a screensaver. Just wait until you see the fishing, 
he told me with a smile. We got to his small aluminium boat and he pulled the cord on the outboard motor. It rumbled to life and it began to steer us out into the heart of the lake. It was larger than expected, extending several kilometers into the distance. There were also islands in the middle of the water which had a couple of different summer homes built on them. I asked Gilbert who the houses belonged to, but the motor was roaring so loud he didn't hear me, or pretended like he didn't. He slowed down at a strange place in the water. I realized as we were getting closer, there was something off about it. The water was bubbling and moving as if being disturbed from underneath. A stretch of about 50 square yards was all affected in the same way. See that? Gilbert asked, pointing at the section of water with a strange disturbance. Yeah, what is it? It looks like the water is boiling. This is what we came out here for, he said, pulling out his fishing rod. That's what I call a trout feeding frenzy. He handed me a line, and I was about to cast it out, but then I noticed there was no bait on it. Uh, can I get a worm or something? I asked. He just shook his head, smiling, and motioned for me to put the line out into the water. There was an immediate hit, and I began to fight with a fish that had been hooked. Wow, you don't even need bait. I reeled in one after another until we had more than enough for dinner. He told me it was like this all the time on the lake, the best freshwater fishing location he'd ever seen in his life, and it was full of rainbow trout as well, which made it all the better. The rich people who used to come up here used to pay to have the lake stocked with rainbow trout, but nobody really fishes it but me, so they got a bit out of control. There's a multitude of them now. You'd think that fishing without any challenge would get boring fast but it doesn't. Still, there's only so many you can catch before you get tired and start to feel like there's no possible way you could ever eat so many. Gilbert reassured me, saying he canned whatever excess he caught. We were about to turn back when I looked over at a nearby island. To my surprise, I saw something looking back at me. I gasped in surprise at the strange sight. It was a massive owl head poking up out of the trees, staring at me, unmoving. I actually screamed when I saw it, and Gilbert followed my gaze and turned to look as well. What the hell? What is that thing? Is it real? It was terrifying, whatever it was. The face was staring at us with a lifelike expression. It's not moving. Is it a statue? How have you never noticed that before? I asked. Aren't you out here all the time? He shook his head. I don't remember ever seeing that before. Whatever it is, it's big. That's got to be 50 feet tall. Gilbert started the engine. Let's go take a look. Maybe it's an old indigenous statue or something like that. I hesitated, feeling slightly irked for some reason. Okay, but just let's turn around if anything feels off, okay? Unsure what exactly I was scared of, we began heading towards the island, the small outboard motor kicking up a cool mist which splashed my face and wet my hands. My heart started pounding faster in my chest and in my throat as we neared a strange pair of eyes overlooking the top of the tree line. Eventually, it disappeared into the boughs and leaves again and I was left with the eerie afterimage of it in my mind. Those eyes staring menacingly outward a face too large to be real. As we came close to the shoreline, I realized how completely alone I was. Gilbert seemed nice enough, but I barely knew him. I had met him through my cousin, who was visiting, and who had flown across the country to see. She had arranged for me to stay with him in his float house on a whim, since she was called into work last minute and he was in town on a supply run. She told me it would be a once in a lifetime experience. Of course, now I was wondering how well she actually knew Gilbert. As it would turn out, not very well at all. Something about this didn't feel right, I was slowly realizing. Something about Gilbert's overall vibe 
was making me uneasy as he helped me off the boat just a little too eagerly. There used to be tribes of indigenous people who lived off the land and fished in this region. I bet it's an old totem pole or something like that. This could be a huge discovery, good eye noticing it. The noise of the engine was gone now and we were left in complete silence again as he tried to lead me away from the boat towards what appeared to be a path into the forest. Hey, maybe... Can we go back? I'm not feeling well. I lied. My stomach is upset. Don't be silly. Come on, it'll just take a minute. It looked like it was just up the hill here. I tried to shake off the feeling of paranoia and half succeeded, then began to follow after him. I looked back over my shoulder at the boat and thought I could always run back to it and use it to escape if I needed to. This path looks pretty well worn, I said, catching up to him. Maybe the folks who lived in those summer houses know something about the statue. Yeah, there could be. I'll have to call up a couple people and see if we're the only ones to have found this place. It was pretty visible from the water, but maybe just from that one angle. That one spot that you chose the fish, I thought to say, but didn't. We came over a ridge, and sure enough, there it was again. Only this time, we could see the whole thing. Up ahead of us, in a clearing, was a massive, towering statue of an owl. It had to be at least 50 feet tall, maybe more. It was difficult to judge, but this was no totem pole. It was as wide as a house at its base, standing, imposing, and impossibly way out here in the middle of nowhere. At the base of the huge, terrifying owl statue was what appeared to be a dais, pulpit, pews, and an altar off to the side of the lectern. That was when I noticed there were people watching us from near the statue, their clothing blending in with the bark of the trees. I saw several figures in brown hooded robes, their faces shrouded in darkness. Moving slowly and deliberately, they produced long, sickle-shaped knives from their deep pockets and began to march towards me. I looked, horrified, towards Gilbert's face. He was wearing a knowing look saying that I had been right to not trust him. He didn't appear surprised to see any of this, and he didn't even bother to try and stop me when I ran, screaming. Instead, his head just turned on a slow swivel, watching me go. I turned and bolted back towards the motorboat. My shoes crunched the dry leaves and pine needles under my feet. I nearly slipped in a mud puddle as I sprinted as fast as I could, too terrified to look back and see if Gilbert was chasing me. I just assumed he was. But by the time I got back to the boat and ventured to look back, I realized that he wasn't close behind me. However, that didn't mean he wasn't still following me and hiding in the trees. I tried to start the engine and realized why he hadn't bothered to put much effort into stopping me. The outboard motor's pull cord was missing. Without it, there was no way to start the engine. Gilbert, the sly asshole, had customized the motor with a clip-on starter cord that he could easily remove without it even being noticed. There were no oars in the boat either, which meant I was stuck. Unless, of course, I could swim across the lake, which I didn't think I was capable of. I'm not a strong swimmer by any stretch, and it was at least a kilometre to the other side, if not more. The sun was beginning to set, I noticed and I looked around the lake to see if there was some other way to escape. That was when I saw all the figures standing on the shoreline across the water. In front of each summer house, there was a dark silhouette looking out at me across the lake. Dozens of them were staring at me in the waning light of the evening. The sounds of motorboats being started up at the same time echoed across the still surface of the lake, and each of them moved in unison towards their vessels. I knew, without a second thought, whoever these people were, they were coming for me. That altar beneath the giant owl statue, that was meant for me. I was going to be their sacrifice. You picked the wrong week to come visit. Sorry, Gilbert said behind me in his thick accent. Once a year they all come here for their meeting, 
I get a bonus if I can find someone for the ceremony. Your cousin didn't know, to her credit. I'll have to tell her there was a boating accident. Something like that. The chubby, red-haired man in overalls laughed, his gut bouncing up and down. He didn't look the least bit sorry. A moment later, they arrived. I saw at least a dozen at first, maybe more. They pulled their boats into the shallows around the island and got out in hip waders, similar to what Gilbert was wearing. I couldn't believe the faces of the ultra-famous people who came towards me from the water's edge. Celebrities, politicians, musicians and pundits. People you wouldn't believe if I told you. All of them in brown, hooded robes. I turned and ran, dodging Gilbert's grasp as he reached out to stop me. You won't get away, he said after me. He called after me, cackling. They're all over the island by now. There's nowhere to run. Ignoring him, I raced down the path through the woods. Stumbling, I landed in a puddle of mud with leaves floating in it and pulled myself up quickly, continuing back towards the other end of the island, towards more sudden death. I didn't know what I'd hoped to achieve. Gilbert was right. I was doomed. Looking back, I saw the group was not far behind. Running up the steep hill, I hoped maybe I could lose them once I reached the top by veering off into the trees for cover. That would be my only hope. Darkness was settling on the island and it was becoming more difficult to see my way as I tripped over roots and ruts in the ground. Finally, I reached the top of the hill and immediately ducked into the trees to the right, hoping to lose them in the twilight darkness of the trees. The sounds of voices coming after me made me run faster than I should have and I suddenly found myself tumbling over the edge of the precipice I hadn't noticed up ahead. I landed hard, hitting my head on a rock. Instantly, everything went black. I woke up, tied to a slab of rock, cold beneath my back. My wrists and ankles were bound tightly, and I couldn't move as someone spoke loudly nearby, sounding as if they were mid-sermon, speaking some dark prayer in a demented church service. Craning my aching head upwards, I looked around to see I was now directly beneath a giant owl statue tied to the altar which I was laid out on top of. A man in a brown robe was on the dais, speaking loudly to the assembled crowd watching from the woods. Each audience member held a torch which flickered and cast them in a warm glow. Through the trees I saw the moon hovering just above the horizon, bloated and crimson. The priest who had been speaking to the crowd finished his dark sermon, and the congregation began to cluck their tongues in response. It was the most unsettling thing I had ever heard. There were hundreds of them, all watching me, clucking their tongues inhumanely as they held candles and observed the priest. Sweat was pouring from my brow and into my eyes as I darted my gaze around the forest, looking for any possible way to escape. I pulled on the bonds holding me to test them but they were fastened tightly in place. Disciples of Moloch, we have gathered here under the blood moon to give a sanguine sacrifice to him. May our offering please him and give us favour in his eyes. The crowd responded, chanting something in reply, which was indiscernible since their muttering voices all mingled together. I realised they were ramping up to killing me, and if I was going to escape it, it would have to be soon. All eyes were still focused on the priest and the dais, and it would be my only chance to get away. I felt something tugging at the ropes on my wrist, and heard a sound coming from behind me. I realised it was the sound of a saw cutting through the bindings. Stay still, act like I'm not here, a voice said from behind me. If they catch me, they'll kill both of us. Despite the man's words, I couldn't help looking back and seeing his face. He was wearing a brown robe like the others. Are you one of them? I asked. Why are you helping me? I'm not really one of them, he said, finishing the rope on my right hand and moving to the other. I'm a reporter. I've been working for years to infiltrate this place and finally did it. I was filming this whole ceremony, but I had to stop to save you. I couldn't just let them kill you. Thank you, I said, overwhelmed with relief. Really, I mean it. I'll pay you back for this somehow, once we get out of here. If we get out of here, he said, 
finishing cutting the bond holding my wrist. Okay, here's the tricky part, the voice said from the shadows behind the altar. As soon as we start cutting those ropes on your legs, they're going to see us doing it. I realized he was right. From the dark place behind me, he cut the ropes holding my wrist, but my feet were facing the crowd. Everyone would see him if he ventured into the front of the altar to cut the ropes. So, what do we do? An explosion suddenly boomed in the distance, and the orange glow of a fireball bursting into the air caught everyone's attention. We'll need a distraction, he said, moving down to my legs, sticking close to the altar to avoid detection. Like that one. Try to get the rope free from the other leg, quick. I sat up and started working on the ropes, finding them tight, tight in knots like I'd never seen. Luckily, the whole audience and the priest at the front were still distracted by the giant cloud of smoke rising in the distance. The last thing people like these wanted was to be seen, and even as far from civilization as we were, an explosion like that could attract attention. The priest was shouting at his acolytes to find out who was responsible for the blast. But suddenly, someone noticed us. A voice began to shout from the audience. Someone is trying to free him, a traitor. Murmuring and cries of outrage rang through the trees, and suddenly, the huge crowd of people were racing down towards us through the woods like an evil mob, torches in hand. The priest turned from his place on the stage and pulled out a long knife from a sheath around his waist. He walked in our direction, just as the ropes gave way and I rolled off the side of the altar. Run, shouted the man who had cut me loose. He bolted off through the trees and I followed after him. We ran through the trees towards the shoreline where a boat was waiting, already running. Another figure could be seen moving along the shore towards the boat and I realized they looked familiar. As we got closer, I saw he was my cousin. It was her who had set off the explosion. Grace, what the hell are you doing here? There's no time. Get in the boat. We all jumped in and she steered the boat off towards the other end of the lake. I was surprised to see nobody following after us and we managed to get to the ocean before anyone found us. It turned out Grace had sabotaged the expensive boats which would have easily outrun us as well as having blown up one of the larger vessels with a homemade bomb. What the hell was that? I asked my cousin after we were safely away from the ceremony. How could you leave me there with that maniac? It turned out Gilbert and the cult who had tried to kill me weren't the only monsters that day. My own cousin set me up just for a story. She knew what was happening on the lake and used me as bait to see if they really would go through with killing a human sacrifice. If it hadn't been for a partner, I would have died but he couldn't go through with it. I live in fear now, wondering when exactly the powerful people who try to kill me will come to find me. I'm sure it won't take long once this is out. After all, I saw their faces. I know what all of them are capable of. They like to live in the shadows. They don't want you to know what they do when you're not watching. But I've seen everything. I was a student and on my own in a new city. Money was always a worry, but I managed to find some ways to make a bit extra. The ones that stand out were a session I did as a life model. I was very embarrassed throughout and I hope anyone painting my face had a good supply of red paint because I was blushing a lot. One afternoon, I gave a DNA sample at a medical facility as part of a research program. This took hours because I also had to fill in a detailed questionnaire about my family medical history, get blood tests and be weighed and measured. They even photographed me. Talk about thorough. Then there was a time I agreed to have a fake tattoo on my forehead to advertise a new clothes shop that had just opened. Their brand was trendy and daring and the tattoo looked so real I got gawped at a lot as I walked up and down the street. I even got my picture on a news website. The people that ran the shop were delighted, and so was I when they paid me twice what we agreed on, cash in hand. 
The fact the fake tattoo took two weeks of me washing my face four times a day to come off was not a problem. My course was difficult, but I was up for a challenge. My apartment was small and had a rodent infestation problem, possibly. I could hear something scurrying around in the cavities at night, and rodents were the least disturbing thing I could think of. So, all in all, I was living my life. Until I saw him, standing in the street outside my window. I'd had a very busy few months, so much so that I hadn't even had time to earn any extra money. There were exams looming, and I'd had a romance with a girl I really liked. I was actually feeling pretty down because she left town, and it looked like that was the end of our relationship. So, I was feeling distracted that day, and had to do a double take to check I wasn't seeing things. I moved closer to the glass and squinted, said, wow, under my breath. The man standing in the street outside my window looked exactly like me. The same almost black and unruly hair, a nose that's one size too big for the face it's on, a clear complexion and brown eyes that were staring back at me. It was the weirdest feeling. I suppose with the billions of people in the world, the odds of some of us having total lookalikes were not beyond possible. But that was my double out there, and from the way they were acting, they wanted to meet me. I had to find out what the hell was going on, so I opened the window, leaned out and shouted, Fourth floor, second left buzzer. My double nodded and disappeared from view. Moments later, I was hearing the clang on the main door opening as I let him in. My apartment was a tip. There was weak old pizza crust on the floor, empty soda bottles everywhere, junk mail and mail I really shouldn't have been ignoring in a growing pile in the hall. My bed was a whirlpool of clothes, books, bedding and yet more pizza remains. If my double is anything like me, he won't mind I thought, then laughed at the strangeness of the situation. The buzzer to my apartment door went, I took a deep breath and went to let him in. The first thing I noticed as I asked him to come in and sit down, and while I was sweeping the worst of the debris off the sofa, was that he really didn't look well. He was kind of pale and had a sheen of sweat. His eyes were bloodshot, and he had the shakes. Seeing him up close though also confirmed my initial impressions. This guy was identical to me, down to the same gap in between his top two teeth but not quite the same voice. His accent was different. It was kind of bland. I noticed this when he said, I'm so sorry. Which was a pretty odd way to start a conversation with a complete stranger, no matter how much he looked like them. About what? I asked. I'm from the south and still have quite the twang. And when I said this, I saw from his expression that my accent was food for thought for him as well. He rubbed his face instead of answering my question. I figured he was exhausted or maybe stressed. Both would explain his pallor. Or perhaps he had some kind of bug. Could I have a glass of water? He asked. Sure, I said, and went in search of the nearest thing I had to a clean glass. Now he was in my apartment, the first twinges of her knees were creeping in. On the one hand, he did look like me. On the other, he was also a complete stranger, was acting weird, was possibly infectious or not in his right mind. And now, he was crying. Hey, I said, handing him the glass of water. What's wrong? He took a sip, eventually. His hands were shaking so bad the surface of the water was seriously choppy and said, I escaped. I had to. I couldn't stand it anymore. All the tests, the uncertainty. It was too much. This came pouring out of him. Then he properly broke down and his tears were now sobs that racked his entire body. Damn, I thought. What had I done inviting him in? 
I felt sorry for him, I really did. But clearly, he had problems that needed professional help. My worry shot up a bunch more levels when he reached out and grabbed my hand. You're the only person I could turn to, he told me with a manic edge to his voice. I saw you this morning, by chance I guess, by freak accident, and I followed you here because I knew that you were the one, that they made me from you. A cold chill ran down my spine. I pulled my hand free. Whoa, dude, I said. I don't know what you're talking about. I asked you up here because I was intrigued by our resemblance. Who wouldn't be? But I'd like you to leave now. I was trying to be reasonable, to hope he would respond well to being treated this way. But he didn't. He started to shake his head and mutter, No, 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 under his breath. I began to consider calling 911. Then, he looked me straight in the eye and said, I need you to believe me. He turned and looked at my laptop, which was balanced precariously on the edge of my garbage tip bed. Go online and look up Futures We Believe MedTech Facility. They are the people responsible. As much to humor him as anything else, that's what I did. The minute he said the name, it sounded familiar, but it wasn't till I was on their corporate website that I realized why. This was the medical facility where I'd given a sample of my DNA for money a few months before. I was clicking through into various pages on the website to give myself time to think what to do about my now unwanted guest. When I saw someone on their Our Staff page, I recognized. Her name was Mary, and she'd been friends with my girlfriend. My ex-girlfriend, I thought with a sigh. I'd only met Mary a couple of times, but she'd seemed nice, and I now recalled her talking about applying for jobs once she finished her PhD. I glanced back at my double. He had his head in his hands and was looking through his fingers at me. He didn't look dangerous at that moment in time. Just lost badly in need of a friend. For better or worse, I decided I would try and help him. I'm going to contact someone I know, I said. They might be able to shed some light on things. Then I tracked down Mary on social media and DM'd her. Hey, it's Matt here, Joseph's friend. I'm researching a paper on the social implications of genetic research and saw you got a cool new job. Wondering if you could spare five. The coffee's on me. I didn't like to lie, but if I told her the truth, she'd most likely block me, and I wouldn't blame her. Still, I wasn't holding up much hope of an answer, and I was wondering if I should wake up my double, who had curled up on the sofa and gone to sleep, when my notification showed I had a new message. What do you know? Mary had got back to me. Hi Matt, good to hear from you. I'm sorry about you and Josie. I don't know if I can be any help, but I'm always up for a free drink. I replied straight away, suggesting we meet at a cafe I found online that was close to where she worked. I showered and found my least smelly clothes and was ready to set off. My double was still fast asleep. I thought about waking him and telling him he needed to leave as I was going out then decided against it. Maybe a good sleep would help him. And let's face it, apart from my laptop, I had nothing worth stealing. I popped the laptop in a backpack and let myself out quietly. It took me about 30 minutes to walk to the cafe and by the time I arrived, Mary was already there. She was sat at a corner table. I smiled and waved and went over to say hi. Hey! She replied. She seemed jumpy, her fingers constantly tapping on the table, and she kept looking over at the door. Is everything okay? I asked. Sure, yeah, she replied. She didn't say this with any conviction, and I could see she'd bitten her fingernails right down. It's just... She continued, then paused because someone had walked into the cafe and she was checking them out. 
Are you expecting someone? I asked. She sighed. Sorry, work is... difficult at the moment. I'm sorry to hear that, I said. And, sighing to myself, I added. I'm also sorry that I lied to you about why I wanted to meet. She clearly had a lot on her mind, and I couldn't keep pretending I was writing a paper. It would have just been plain wrong. Her fingers stopped tapping, and she exclaimed, What? I took a deep breath and told her everything about my encounter with my double. She grew increasingly pale as I spoke, and when I had finished, she asked, Have you ever given a DNA sample? I nodded. A few months ago, at the facility where you work, it was an easy way to make money. She swore, then leaned forwards and said in a quiet voice, You must keep this to yourself. The people I'm working for are creating clones, human clones. I have no in-person interactions with the clones, but it sounds like that's who you met. My clone? I said incredulously and far too loud. I lowered my voice and added, That's crazy and completely illegal, surely. It is, she replied. All the work is taking place below the line, with absolute deniability built in. Not just because it's unethical and against the law to clone another person, with or without their permission, but also because the methods they are employing are incredibly dangerous. They are using experimental drugs that cause the cells to multiply at a tremendous rate. That's how your clone reached its adult form in the space of just a few months and... She suddenly stopped and was looking over my shoulder. I glanced around. Two middle-aged men had come into the cafe. Both wore plain business suits and they were looking at us. Who are they? I asked Mary. She was looking down into a coffee, almost as if somehow this would mean the men couldn't see her. Whoever they were, she was clearly scared of them. Still staring at a drink, she said, Facility security, you should leave. I'll message if I can. I figured it was best to do as she said and got to my feet. My legs felt unsteady as I headed out back onto the street. My encounter with my double had already left me feeling very unsettled. My conversation with Mary had further thrown me, leaving me shocked and confused. Feeling like my nerves had been in a cocktail shaker, I made my way back to my apartment. My double, my clone, was still there. He was still laid out on the sofa, and he was in a very bad way. He was coated in sweat and seemed to be delirious. He was trying to say something, but I couldn't hear what, so I leaned in close. He was saying, it hurts, over and over again. Our faces were almost touching. I could feel his breath on my face. I was transfixed. This man was more than a double. He was a being that shared my DNA. We were built from the same blocks. And now I knew this, it felt like I was looking in a mirror. That I saw myself die. So my eyelids grow still, my breath cease, my body stop moving. I cursed, snapped myself out of my daze. Felt for his pulse, but there was nothing. I turned my mobile to camera and held the screen almost touching his lips. It didn't fog. My thoughts began to race. I knew I had to call the emergency services and report this, but I first needed to throw up. I returned from the bathroom a few minutes later to yet another shock. My clone was moving again. His eyelids were flickering rapidly. His arms and legs jerked. It was as if he was having some kind of seizure. Man, I said, you gave me a serious fright there. I thought you were dead. I'm going to phone an ambulance for you. As I was keying in 911, a new message appeared from Mary. They know where you live. You need to get out of there now. What the hell? I said and called her. She answered on the first ring. Matt, I can't talk for long. I think they're following me. Who are? I asked. Facility security, she replied. I didn't go back to work. 
I needed time to think, so I went to the park instead. I'm sure I've just seen them. You should phone the police, I told her. They wouldn't believe me, and even if they did investigate, the facility would cover up the truth. About the clones, I got in. It's more than just about the clones. She sounded breathless when she said this, as if she was walking quicker and quicker. It's about a problem that is caused by the rapid multiplication of the cells. This is killing the clones, but the drugs then keep acting after death, multiplying cells at obscene speed, and the clones are reanimated. They become zombies. Before she could say more, the call ended. I looked at the icon, my mind reeling at what she had told me. Then I became aware that my clone was getting to his feet, was standing there, swaying slightly, as if he was trying to remember how to walk, how to talk. I... I don't feel right, he said in a halting voice. Because you're dead, I thought. And then someone kicked the door in. Two men burst into the apartment. They wore the same plain business suits as the men in the cafe, but I'd never seen them before. One of them pulled out a gun. You need to come with us, he said. No, I yelled at him. We know what you're doing. The unarmed man smiled. It's not we anymore, he said. It's just you now. The one problem left. The one problem that can be easily eliminated. What have you done to Mary? I shouted. The armed man answered by pointing the gun at my head. Guess, he said. Fear flooded my body. No, I begged. Please, don't. It's too late, he told me. Suddenly, his partner screamed. It was a primal cry of pain that filled the apartment. I tore my gaze away from the barrel of the gun pointing at me and saw that the unarmed man was being torn apart. His head was almost severed and blood was spouting from the jagged wound that ran down the length of his neck. My clone held him by the scalp and was pulling. The head lifted, trailing a crimson slick spinal cord and finally was separated. The man's mouth was still open his eyes staring, but unlike my clone, I did not think there was any way back for him. He was dead meat. The man with the gun opened fire. Six bullets ripped through my clone's body. He looked down at the wounds as if they were nothing more than smoldering kisses, then threw himself at the man. He clamped his jaws down at the base of the man's neck and ripped out a chunk of flesh. The man howled with pain. Then his legs gave way as he crumpled to the ground. My clone spat out the bloodied slab and fell on the man, began to devour him. I became a fugitive after this, from the facility. I spent all my money on a rundown car and kept driving, heading out into the desert. My clone was with me, cloaked in a blanket so no one could see him. He had barely spoken since slaughtering the men and saving my life in the process. I couldn't leave him behind after that. The man who was made from me. The zombie. I didn't believe I was in danger from him because of our genetic link. He had, though, continued to deteriorate. Necrotic wounds had started to appear all over his flesh, and the sickly sweet scent of decay drifted from him. He said little and stared morosely out the window at the desolate landscape. I had recorded an account of what had happened on my phone. One day, somehow, I would hold the facility to account for what they had done. I was trying to think of how, when, next to me, the zombie started to cry. It was not the first time since we fled. I had no words of comfort, and silence soon returned. Until the zombie said, Stop the car. What, here? I asked. Yes. He sounded insistent, so I pulled over. There were no other cars in sight. No buildings. We were hundreds of miles from anything. Slowly, clearly hurting, the zombie got out of the car. I peered through the open door, asked, What are you doing? 
You need to leave me here, the zombie replied. My thoughts are clouding over worse and worse, and soon I won't recognize you anymore. Then the hunger will come. I can't just leave you here, I protested. The zombie looked at me. You're not, it said. You're going to end me. When we fled the apartment, I'd instinctively grabbed the gun the man had dropped when he was attacked. I'd hidden it under my car seat when we set off. I had no intention of using it. I was appalled, sickened, terrified by what was being asked of me. I'm not going to do that, I said. You're me. Not now, the zombie said sadly. Not anymore. He spoke to me quietly as we walked away from the car, as together we dug a grave for him. He told me that of everything he could remember. The only time he had not felt scared and alone was as he had been falling asleep on the sofa in my apartment. The sound of the gunshot that followed still echoes in my mind. <laughs>